Thank you all. I lift my glass to you all. Thanks for your company and thanks for your ears. Um, I, now, this is obviously an ongoing project. Um, and uh, I'm going to make mistakes. There, there are lots of things, lots of misapprehensions I've got. But the purpose, I feel, of science and scientific method in my life is to find, to try and identify my, the misapprehensions, the, the models that aren't very good representations of the realities. Um, and part of that is uh, peer review, like you mentioned, Steve. So um, I start from the position uh, that knowledge is inherent in experience. And you can see on the website my uh, essay on a theory of inherent knowledge. Um, and simply being in an environment we're taking in uh, vast amounts of information and seeing that information change over time and consciousness, our consciousness is trying to make sense, trying to see patterns and structures in uh, what we're encountering. Um, and, and I also argue that we've, we've got uh, available to us common instruments to draw upon to know things. So the, the, the essay, The Common Instruments of Knowledge, looks at this in terms of not who has an electron microscope or a set of binoculars or, or fancy tools, but what, what's, what, what are the tools in our own consciousness and physicality that we use to work things out, to try and come to know things? Um, and part of my argument comes from learning from a, a, a philosopher called Georges, uh, a sophist. And uh, Georges' trident argues, um, he, he, he said that there were two major barriers to knowledge. One between the person and the thing in itself, uh, you know, the out there, the universe, uh, things beyond our senses. And the second barrier he proposes is the barrier between the apprehension and communicating this knowledge to others. And uh, uh, that was particularly provocative to me because I'm interested in learning and education. Um, and having studied various aspects of this, um, uh, there's, there is a relationship I can have between myself and you know, the, the, the world out there. So I can have a, a, sort, a, a sort of dialogue with a tree. I could, can spend time around it. I can look at the insects. I can look at the, the acorns and how the acorns turn to oak apples, you know, oak galls, because parasitic wasps lay their eggs in the acorns. And you know, I can learn about the, the history you know, from a, a culture that humans did, have developed of sharing knowledge. So there's that second relationship, my relationship with other humans in society. Uh, I, I, I can, there, I believe that I can come to know things, but a part of uh, a, a deeper uh, strand of that knowledge is where I find the language that uh, appropriately um, articulates what I've experienced. And I can then put it before other people and people can make sense of it and go, 
Alex, I think you've missed this aspect, but I agree with this aspect. Talking of <clears throat> aspects, I mean, one of the problems for me has always been that the nature of science itself is up for debate because in order to have science, you have to believe that there is a discoverable rational reality. And that's an assumption. We don't actually know that that's true. But because that's if it's not true, then... then it's, sorry? It's a reasonable assumption. Well, as opposed to a kind of a, a religious... Where do you find the evidence? Sorry? Around us all the time, this kind of Alex has been well, You can find evidence for some things, but that doesn't mean that you're actually proving that the system as a whole is true. You can prove that some things within the system are true if you accept the system. Well, but if you actually question the, tenets, the system itself... The particular tenets of knowledge are arguable, but the fact of reality is surely not. No, you're talking about what you can prove within the system. I'm saying, no, no, no. Actually, what we've got to discuss to start with is why do we believe in the system at all? Um, surely if, like, you can, like, theorize something and then and kind of, like, predict it, that kind of shows that there's, like, a solid foundation there and that like, there's some sort of possibility that there's a reality. So... I, I, I'm hearing in, in this conversation uh, aspects of, of uh, science, scientific method that have been fleshed out by various thinkers. And I'm going to hopefully introduce, introduce a few, such as Karl Popper, the, the idea of experimenting. And, and falsification. Uh, falsification, indeed. Um, and, and, I mean, we're perceiving, we're pattern perceivers, you know, a big part of us, and we're, we're looking for structure, some, something that, that follows patterns, and we look at patterns that connect patterns, and we try and make sense of that. So, um, I... And part, part of what I'm going to do is, is look at a, a thinker on, on semantics uh, and how we can get lost in the, the words, the, the human culture, the, the human theatre. And, and that human theatre can diverge from, um, from the actual world. So... For example, let, let's think of um, how at one point there were doctors saying, oh, Chesterfield cigarettes are very good for your lungs. You know, great for all aspects of health. And a process of testing and arguing and uh, working out what, what is the repeatedly demonstrable truth of the matter was an increasingly reliable knowledge. And that fell down on the side of, well, when you're smoking cigarettes, it knackers your lungs and, you know, we see this increase in cancer. Um, so I suggest we can and do negotiate obstacles to knowledge and that we can and do come to know things. Uh, and I take a sceptical position. Um, and uh, a, a, the major distinction between the, uh, a cynical position and a sceptical position is, uh, as, as I understand it, a cynical position is uh, one that is based on an article of faith. It's a dogma. They have unshakable belief that this is their, their their perspective is right and whatever evidence is presented it still will not change their minds a skeptical position is one where uh, you you're questioning constructively questioning uh, and you're you're looking to test ideas and find evidence for them. Um, and, and of course, I, I, I like the, the agnosticism of Thomas Henry Huxley, uh, commonly known as uh, Darwin's bulldog, 
who argued <laughs> that I, I love I love you, raised eyebrows. Have what you was ever read it? Uh, well, Thirteen volumes of kind of completely incomprehensible prose. Well, you think know, so things were written. Styles of writing were were very different in different uh, ages, um, and uh, yeah. So lang language is a big big thing here. Um, so the agnosticism is: I'm presented with an idea, and I don't. I I start from this position of well, I don't know, but I'm not going to rule it out in or out without finding bodies of evidence. I'm looking for evidence to move this model I've been presented along a scale of increasingly or decreasingly reliable knowledge. Can I come back though? Because yep. I mean I think you know if we're going to discuss what science is within the model that we accept about science, that's one thing. But to say that science itself is a true model is something else. And I think about the Gödel theorem, for example, uh, you know, which says that for any system, there will be things that are true within that system, which you cannot prove within the system. He was, talk yes. was talking about mathematics principally, but that's been applied <laughs> elsewhere. And that's one of the problems with science as well. You know, we can make an assumption that science is a system and that we can prove some things within that system, but whether that's the whole picture or not, it's a whole different ball game because there may well be things or ways of looking at things which are true, which are not covered by the scientific system. Well, the thing is, surely, that, that there's no kind of established way of proving something to be the case. You know, because there's always, you mentioned Popper, uh, there's always going to be, you know, things that falsify it. And so we just kind of get on with intuition, with you know, our hunches, and that's what science is about. And it's based on verifiable uh, evidence, but doesn't need to prove. But I was talking to, to Alex earlier and saying I amended his title a bit in my own mind because his title was, you know, how do we know what we think we know? And my question was, how do we think we know what we think we know? <laughs> because I'm a psychologist and I'm a scientist and I do believe in science. And I, mean, I, I believe in logic, I believe in, in uh, evidence and so on. But I also believe that the way in which human beings see things is not necessarily always that straightforward, and that therefore we well, may be deluded not. about some of the aspects about science. Well, we'll talk about psychology another time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like the, what, what Richard Feynman said about science. <laughs> science is something we've developed to keep us from fooling ourselves. And it's a collection of tools, strategies, and methodologies. Uh, it's not necessarily an absolute system or a model um, because uh, of our ever-expanding understandings. Are, or with. That, that, that's a very desire, uh, an optimistic statement, but I, I think the, we do see ideas advance over time. I, would, I, I think I could lay out an evidence base to show that in certain specific uh, circumstances. And that notion of specific is very, I, I think is very helpful. Um, and being specific and, and the way that we use words uh, is is, uh, is an important aspect of how we're going to parse knowledge. So critical in, in scientific methods uh, is, is giving meaningful definitions to the words we use. And uh, I, I, I often use etymology uh, to, to explore the, the core dynamics of a word. Uh, an example is, uh, you can see the etymology of society is companionship. That makes a heck of a lot of sense to me in terms of sociology. Um, uh, 
so I, I, I check the meanings of words and I look for, for uh, definitions that, that have meaning and meaning, um, meaningfulness comes from the, the concreteness and a, a certain amount of checking, error, you know, checking for errors um, goes on in, in parsing language. And there's, there's a lot of categoricals, you know, understanding how categorical statements are used um, in discussion is a very helpful way I've found of unpacking and sometimes separating ideas uh, or arguments out that, that become conflated. Um, uh, in, indeed, I mean, uh, you, you could argue that one of Einstein's major advances was he brought definitions to terms that had not previously been given explicit Definition. Do you want to explain that? I don't get that. Well, so so what what do you, what do we mean by time? Mix up with space. Call it <laughs> <time>. <laughs> uh, yes, and, and so so uh, time. And according to the Bible, it didn't exist before God made it. So so instantly we we're, we're, we're starting to get we can we can accumulate different definitions uh, going on. But some people would argue that there's no time. Uh, in the latest studies were suggesting that time existed before the universe. That's a, that's a good one, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, how would you prove that? <laughs> so, yeah, what, and my, my, my personal course in this has, I, I'm, I'm very interested in the, the practical. What, what's testable, what's practical, what's practicable? Uh, so was it Bertrand Russell who spoke about the idea that somewhere between here and the moon there's a, a cup of tea waiting for us? Or it might, I... Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yes, so, yes. So, Russell. No, no, no it's, uh, you know, I know that cups of tea exist. <clears throat> well, <laughs> uh, and I know that space exists and I've seen the moon. I've got these relative, uh, th these meanings I've attributed to words and I can ascribe to those words, those, those experiences. And that makes it meaningful in having dialogue and conversation. What is the moon? I, it was, was quite funny in uh, does anybody watch QI? Uh, <laughs> the, you know, the part of the comedy arc is the fact that facts keep on changing. And they, they, they throw their hands up. Oh, of course, now there's three moons, now there's nine moons. What defines a moon? And a lot of it comes back to cultural, the, the convergence of a culture of people on a definition. Um, and these cultures can shift over time according to their usefulness. Um, but the other thing is that when you get down to the level of things like quantum physics, it turns out that some things are only true when they're observed. Well, indeed. But, but who's it? Was it Rutherford or some you know, famous scientist said there are only two people in the world that understand quantum physics. Or, and I can't think of the other one. <laughs> well, the, the one I always remember, somebody ever tells you they understand quantum physics and no, they no, don't. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but you know, the fact is that, that science itself is throwing up paradoxes that actually lead us to question the whole basis on which we constructed science. <laughs> I, I, I first got very interested in science because Edinburgh's a very Booky city, particularly when you look in bins, because you've got <laughs> you get cohorts of students coming in and then going, and then they take their textbooks and they either dump them at the in the bins or in the charity shops. And I just thought, oh, a, a pound fifty for a fifty pound book, what's in here? 
and understanding these uh, health claims like, uh, oh, vitamin C is good for colds. So how, how, do, how do I attribute value to, to a statement like that? So, well, that was kind of a weird thing, wasn't it? An American scientist, uh, Lyle Bowing, who claimed that, and he used to take huge amounts of vitamin C with no kind of fundamental basis of the claim. Well, the, 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 I think that person taking <coughs> huge quantities well, of vitamin quantities D at the moment vitamin C to, to, uh, to, to help him to long you. COVID. Well, vitamin D is one that's currently popular, but vitamin C, which you're talking about, actually, it turns out that taking huge quantities of vitamin C is harmful it's for poisonous. two yes. reasons. Because one is that the body has to get rid of it because it can't use it. So it has to have manufacture ways of disposing of the vitamin C. And in the course of doing that, there are some toxic effects. So, but yeah, but that, that's, that to me is a sideline. I mean, that's looking at a particular instance. And yes, there may be proof one way or the other. But for me, the bigger question, uh, which, you know, okay, I'll stop coming back to it all the time, is, <laughs> you know, does the system apply at all or, or does it apply in the way you think it applies? This, this is why I chose to bring practical science into my life. It is lovely reading about it. It's lovely being told what to, th to think. But there's a whole part of my experience where I've neither got a book or another person to tell me what to think. And, uh, well, so how do I practically measure these things? How do I uh, test or, or uh, understand these truth claims? And got me into reading and started to, me to realize things like, I mean, the National Library of Scotland, what a treasure trove. Um, there we've got a Royal Warrant Library, which since the age, you know, the, what, 1600, the, the, the Royal Warrant was, I, in the ideal, this will hold a print copy of everything that's been in print. Uh, and that, uh, that's fascinating in itself. But then we've, we've now come into the internet age and the computer age. Uh, imagine if Aristotle had a PC. <laughs> You know, and, and on top of that, imagine the, the fact that an, an average cheap PC, you can now, you can hold more books than are held in the Library of Congress on it. Uh, but, I mean, also, but also a huge amount of disinformation as well. Ah, uh, yes. Which is an important kind of, you know, comparison. And this, this comes back to the thinking through the, the scientific methods. How do we uh, distinguish something that's uh, got treat, greater truth value than uh, less, lesser truth value? And there are various philosophers who responded to that. For example, the in response to the, the, the Nazi regime, uh, which was appropriating all manner of knowledge to go, oh, well, we're the super guys. And, and there was a real reaction across the world. And the, the Vienna Circle Club together went, wait a minute, we've got to try and bring definition to what we mean by reliable knowledge. Well, how do we know what we think we know? And how do we think we know what we think we know? Because uh, something that I have learned over my lifetime is I've consistently made errors or, or inconsistently made errors. So thinking about a, a, a cyberneticist called Gregory Bateson, I'm interested in his discussion of epistemological error checking. And if we, we become unmoored from the means of that checking the source of knowledge and the veracity, we, we, we end up making, uh, running into catastrophic problems. We, we become blind to the information 
the, 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 the universe is always presenting to us. Um, Can I uh, interrupt you there? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a real problem with the word veracity, because that means kind of solid, proven truth. Mm. It's kind of what you were arguing against earlier. Uh, and I think veracity is, I mean, truth is, is slippery. It's kind of negotiable. Uh, and it's not there as a kind of a solid. And some is more slippery or less slippery than other statements. Well, it's kind of evidential, yes. So, so should we not believe anything then? Oh, I think we should. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I certainly... Well, truth is slippery or the biggest degrees of slippery or whatever. Should we not believe anything? Well, this this is why I'm interested in scientific method. I I, I personally, have, I I think yes, we should believe in things, uh, particularly when we we experience uh, evidences for those things. Uh, so if I let go of this glass, will it fall to the floor and make a mess? I'm not not going to test this here now, but trust me, I've tested it over time. And I've made a lot of mess. And I've had silly ideas at points that have been corrected by, uh, you know, kicking a brick. Uh, Bishop Bar Was it Bishop Barclay who said, I refute, refute the thus. You know, we can have an idea and really want it to be true. And of course, psychology is, is a part of this. Humans... Uh, that makes it true, then. What I does... But just to come back to your point about truth being slippery, which it is, but there are levels of evidential concreteness, if I can put it that way, which gives but certain... But there's nothing certain. So, yeah. Can I... Re... So what level of concreteness is that then? Um, evidentially based. Well, it's pragmatic at the end of the day. So, you know, the, the, one of the things you mentioned was that the whole concept of science is a tool. You know, and it, it's like having a screwdriver, and it may not have been the screwdriver that was made for that particular screw, and it may not fit perfectly, but the screw till still turns. So, I mean, science no, is right. a tool that we have to actually deal with the realities with which we are faced. And in a sense, you know, although I was arguing that science itself may be in doubt, the fact is that you know we need some sort of tool in order to deal with reality as we see it, whether that's real reality or not. And science is the tool, and we use science because, on the whole, it works. It's pragmatic. Yeah, I think, I think too, the word that you used earlier, skepticism, I think that, that's important here because you also have to think about the political and cultural of what he has the power to decide what is put out there as evidence mm -hmm. and who doesn't. Um, a whole organization do, do well, it for so so their best of interest. That's the right. Science so, is a big business, isn't it? So I think, you know, I, I mean, I think there was nothing worse than listening to, um, oh, I don't know, Boris Johnson and others saying, um, you know, <laughs> we're following the science, uh, a statement which just said, you have no idea what you're talking about, um, because what is the science? You've never thought of that. Um, so what is science? Um, and so I don't think I think it can be used in all sorts of different ways, and that different people have the power to use it in different ways, which in itself can build up an evidence base which may or may not be absolutely accurate. And if I come back to psychology, us. there's the experimenter effect, yeah. which is that to some extent, if you're doing an experiment to try and prove something, if it's what you believed in, in the first place, you're more likely to prove it correct. Yes. Because there's a personality effect, even in terms of the way in which science is conducted. So, yeah. <laughs> methods of error checking have helped arrive at introducing ideas like this. You know, somebody thought about this, analysed it, went, I think this is worth to us having in our lexicon, the experimenter effect. And, and language, so uh, I'll return to the word specific. Now, there are instances where if I let go of this, it won't fall. Maybe I'm on the moon, 
or, or, it or will a will fall slower. Uh, you know, it will. The the parameters are changed, and you have to then start thinking about the forces of gravity. So Isaac Newton famously is, is credited with with uh, articulating gravity, and he didn't bring a systematic account. He just he made a, a statement: gravity is, and this is how it operates. Um, but there were, uh, I think it was Descartes had had the. Uh, uh, contemporary perspective and Descartes was saying well it's not enough just to say something does happen we need to give an account of why something is happening so you, you mentioned vitamin D and vitamin D research uh, there, there's some very interesting stuff in response to to COVID and there were uh, there's a professor Semmel who brought together 27 trials in an internet uh, uh, presentation he did, and he said this this is a useful tool in health and well-being. And he talks through these 27 papers. That was really interesting. But for me, having read some uh, pharmacy textbooks. Uh, there, there's a, a saying in, in pharmacy, it's not enough to know that something does, you know, a drug does something. What's imperative in our science is that we understand the mechanisms of action. So that provided me with a, a pleasant project to go and study the biochemistry of vitamin D and see what independent researchers, thinkers who have studied this molecule, <clears throat> Have, have understood about how it's working in the chemistry of living tissues. And uh, I started to understand, all right, okay, there are mechanisms of action that, that we can look at. And that, for me, moved the, the presentation of that information along the scale to becoming increasingly reliable knowledge because I was cross-correlating different thinkers. Right? This person saying this and this person saying this. Now, if these truth claims are true, then there must be you know, evidence to show that. And lo and behold, by searching uh, peer-reviewed, studies and looking at textbooks well yeah the, 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 there's quite quite a, an elaborate collection of writings looking at how this functions as a biological molecule coming on to you know moving on from language language is is a a, a tool we use to map our experience um, and uh, has anybody heard the expression, uh, the map is not the territory? Mm -hmm. The map is not the territory. territory. Yeah. yeah. So the, 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 this, this was uh, uh, an axiom uh, in uh, Alfred Korzybski's work, uh, who wrote a theory of general semantics. And one of the principles in his... Uh, Third supplement uh, is was it, it was on systems of non-Aristotelian ways of valuing things. <laughs> Excitingly named. Uh, I, I had to do a lot of reading about that. I, I, so the, the, the thrust of the map is not the territory. Is we make mental models. We make maps. We can walk. I can walk through a territory, and I can make a cipher of my experience. There's a mountain here. There's a river here. The safe way to go through is here. You're looking for a big tree over here. Now, that is a very helpful heuristic. I've encoded the information I've learned 
into a map that will serve uh, as a model that I can use in, at a future date. I can also share that map with others and go, well, this is how you get from A to B. Uh, but that map, you know, the, there's always more detail in the universe than what we can create in the ciphers of our universe. We're making an abstraction from our experience. And language is a series of models we use to communicate metaphors of our experience so we can be in dialogue and make these comparisons and do the epistemological error checking. You know, does this make sense to you? Oh, well, you, you know, this, this map, you've completely left out this feature. Um, and, uh, another, and becoming unmoored from returning to the actual reality. You know, the, another way to put it is the, the food is not, the, the menu is not the food. Uh, we can look at this and live in that abstraction but it's not the, the food that will arrive at the table. And if anything I've known from uh, the points I've been in McDonald's, <laughs> you know, it's very different from what I've seen. But I've also been told, you know, I've read a, a press release saying McDonald's is very nutritious foods. Well, there are other maps, you know, that I can use to, check that press statement. Is it, you know? And that takes me into sciences. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, here, here's a question for everybody. Can you think of a word that has no meaning? Meaningless. <laughs> Very, very meaningful. <laughs> so, so language really, I mean, it's, it's a model and these models, uh, we correct, we change, we learn new ones. Well, language is a kind of a tricky one, isn't it? Because you, you've talked about uh, semiotics, but the founder of semiotics was obviously Ferdinand de Saussure, you know, and there were two things, there was a sign and a signifier, and the signifier under, I won't go into it in detail, but under French structuralism, became displaced, became lost under the signs. So we just live in this world of signs. Well, uh, you've, you've got people like uh, Francis Bacon, who in his Novum Organum, new instrument, uh, was up, uh, one, one of the thrusts of that was We've got to go back to our first, the first principles of experience and check what we know. Um, and that's, that's how we um, are to get to more complex levels of, of knowing. Um, and, some of, the, some of the words here I'm going to drill down to. So I look, looked at the, the root of the word science, and it comes from the, the Latin science, meaning knowledge. How am I making sense of knowledge? Well, it's a, knowledge is something I arrive at through a process of coming to know. Um, I, and that process of coming to know requires efforts on my part of proximity often and um, investment of effort. So uh, interestingly, the, the, the uh, root of expertise has, uh, comes from experience and it, that, that means to try. And, Scientific method and science in general as an endeavor as a pro project is not necessarily about uh, finding the truth about something, but it, it's equally invested in going, well, is this true or is this 
not true. Is, does this hold in this specific context? If it doesn't, you know, how, how does that change the way we're thinking about this context and these things? Your questioning about language is interesting because I mean, to some extent, the way in which we define the world is in terms of the language we use. And not everybody uses language the same way. I mean, it's quite interesting if you actually go to different cultures, different languages, different backgrounds, who sometimes don't have words for things that we might take for granted. I mean, one of the examples I always come up with is there are some African tribes that have no concept of blue. Now, that doesn't mean that blue doesn't exist, because blue at the end of the day is so many angstroms of, of light or whatever it happens to be. So, but you know, the word that we've used to describe that doesn't describe it for them. You know, that concept is not there. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? Because the kind of seven colours of the rainbow, which Newton described, were just imaginary. Mm. You know, they didn't. Do you know what indigo looks like? I don't. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it was a spiritual number, so he imagined that there would be seven colours of the rainbow. But interestingly, my, my son, oh, this is a little personal anecdote, has just come back from a year in Japan. And they have a completely different linguistic system of ideograms as opposed to vowels and consonants and whatever. It's just, you know. Well, the one that I'm familiar with is Chinese or Chinese culture. Because well, it's the same. Chinese, it's, it's, and, you know, again, they have a range of concepts which I don't generally have. And equally, Concepts that are very familiar to me mean nothing to them in some cases. You know, and so even the starting point of trying to describe something can be problematic because it involves what language have you invented to describe this in the first place? What, what, what terminology are you using? And of course, we've got Donald Trump and Kelly <laughs> and they all saying there are alternative <laughs> facts. <you know? laughs> yes. uh, this, this is a good, good point to, to bring in uh, some of Karl Popper. So Karl Popper is, is uh, most famously known for, for his work on falsification. Um, and uh, it, he, he, he... You should explain that. I, I'm, I'm going, going on to... Yes, I'm, I'm going, going on to, to give a, a, a bit of a detailed... Uh, account of of his work, so he was he's um, tr trying to make a contribution to practical definitions which de demarcate what constitutes scientific knowledge from other types of knowledge. Um, uh, Popper's work was published at uh, a time. Um, it, it's often spoken about in context with the Vienna Circle, uh, the, these groups of philosophers, this group of philosophers who were wanting to establish uh, how knowledge is understood in relation to uh, how, you know, it's truth claims. Um, his, his theory of falsifiability laid out in his work uh, distinguishes uh, different types of knowledge um, chiefly through the principle of how testable our, our hypothesis is. So we have ideas, we formulate them into hypotheses, ideas that we can communicate, and then we test those hypotheses. We devise uh, tests and increasingly rigorous tests to, to see whether that, this model stands up or what or at what point the the model breaks down and the new model needs to be to be sought the, the more testable hypothesis is the greater its falsifiability um, and the more explicitly an idea can be tested to see if it holds in uh, holds true in various circumstances the more scientific the knowledge um, and it is always an ongoing process of verification, he, he suggests. Um, 
the the scientific method you're you're because Popper was testing. vehemently opposed to the notion of verification. Well, I I know I well, we, okay. So he he was he was a a, a, a toy that I'm pushing around okay. in thought, right? Okay. So if we're looking at uh, the 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 all the future, a lot of the future is unknowable because it's not happened yet. It certainly passed what uh, Karl Mogorov, as a mathematician, calls the complexity horizon. Um, so can I make a statement and will that hold true in a thousand years? Um, and That's looking out into the future, and I, 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 I'm looking at the, the Port Royal philosophers and thinking about the, the retrospective. So, can I say that it is absolutely true that when I let go of this pen, it has fallen to the floor? Let's test that. I saw that. I, it's good to get independent observers. Um, so, now, making that statement, that retrospective statement, is that 100% true, Steve? Well, it depends, because... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you because me out what, what, one of the, the questions is, did it fall at 32 feet per second per second? Because that's what science tells you the force of gravity is. But in fact, actually, gravity is not a single force. It varies even on Earth, and it certainly varies once you start getting into space. And even Einstein's theories of gravity are now being challenged as not necessarily what completely yeah. correct in all yeah, the There's also this kind of confusion in science between gravitational force, force and inertial force, mm. which seem to be the same thing, but maybe they're not. Yeah. You know, when a spaceship takes off at 32 miles per second per second, you know, you feel the same gravity. No. Acknowledging that both of these, you know, this, this conversation is rich and valuable, I'll return to the specific statement I made, which were, was the parameter of my model, and the, the that was what well, did it fall, did it fall to the floor? I, I asked if if I like, it had a predictable consequence. But whether that meant that the model itself was absolutely correct is a different matter. Oh, well, I was asking whether a statement, my statement in retrospect, was absolutely true. So achieving the one that is, 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 is that veracity? I, for practical reasons, I, I certainly say, if I let go of this pen, it will fall to the table. I'm going to test that. I witnessed that. I'm pretty sure that has happened. Now I'm open to psychologists going, "We're gonna well, maybe maybe uh, get you exercising your your questioning whether you're perceiving reality." Um, can I can I just come back to something there, Alex? Because I don't think you've really um, fully explained I've not the notion to... of induction. And the easiest comparison is swans. You go to Darlington Lock, you go to Inverleaf Park, and see all the swans are white. And so you conclude all the swans are white. But then you go to Australia and you see black swans. And so that just collapses. And that's the kind of where induction so returning, falls down. Yes, returning to the Although specific construction of my, the, lang the statement I made is retrospective and it's not making a statement about all futures. It was making a statement about what has just passed. So, and now I don't know whether this would, will or does stand up to scrutiny by professional philosophers who really know, you know, gone around the houses, but for me in practical terms, there is, uh, I'm, I'm, taking that as a practical truth and 
I'm going to, because I've seen an evidence base and tested it over time, the falsify the, the principle in Karl Popper's terms is, yeah, it's, it's increasing real reliable knowledge. It's moved from an idea to well, a many, hypothesis. Many, many, many philosophers don't subscribe to that notion of falsifiability. Yep. You know, the, the argument is, there are two philosophers whose names I can't recall, um, the argument is that you change the parameters enough, anything is, you know, you can cope with it within, without falsifying it. And, and uh, you know... Joe Quine. <laughs> yeah, Joe and William Clark Quine, that's it, yeah. Uh, and, and these are rich conversations, but I, I'm aware that some uh, perspectives are, are solipsistic, they're self-referential, and hard, because you can't get beyond them, they're hard to falsify. And Popper talks about this. It is, uh, so he, he uses the example of uh, Karl Marx, and he says, well, Karl Marx was working on a scientific theory of history, and he suggested that this, Karl Marx's work in re relation to Albert Einstein's work is much less testable. I think he also made the same claim, if I can give you, if you give me, about Freud. Um, yeah, so, so and, and he, say, he, he also made the, the point of saying, just because it's not scientific knowledge does not make it useless or unvaluable. It's a different category of knowledge. Scientific knowledge, he was arguing, is testable. And uh, the more testable, uh, the more an idea can be shown and to fail, and the more tests it passes, the more scientific in its nature. I know what you're getting at, and to a large extent I agree with you, and, you know, when you drop the pen, you drop the pen, but that comes back to the word I was using before, which is pragmatic. I mean, we know that that happens. Yeah. That's not science. The science is trying to explain why it happens and how it happens. Well, the causality is, is, is the questionable thing, isn't it? <laughs> you, know, you mentioned Hume, you know, the great cynic about mm. causality. Uh, you know, we can't see causality. We just see one thing after another. Well, you, so we don't actually see the force of gravity or anything like that. I, he was particularly enamoured with Einstein's work because uh, much of it uh, was beyond the sphere of Albert Einstein's influence. Uh, and we, we had to wait decades until people got into space so that the, these ideas could, could be tested. And then, you know, space travel happened and they went, oh, well, let, let, let's, let's try testing this. And uh, I, th I think they took um, uh, atomic clocks out of the Earth orbit to understand and or test the idea that you would say, well, time is relative. Well, I, um, I, 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 I'm not sure that's strictly accurate because I think there were tests in the 1920s of Einstein's theories, the Mitchell Mori experiment with the bath of mercury and yeah, the granite, the precision of mercury. Yeah. You know, so there were tests that kind of gave, you know, confirming, not proof, but confirming. Yes, yeah, it evidence. moves to in the direction it becomes in, increasingly reliable over time, uh, and and the, these these categories, these fairly fuzzy but uh, categories, uh, an idea becomes a hypothesis, a hypothesis, uh, uh, you know, is. is uh, 
as it, it becomes verified and tested more, it becomes a model that people use and uh, until that model breaks down and we, we, we look for another. And, and when models become so use, used and useful, they, they become discussed as laws, you know, the laws of thermodynamics. Now we know that there are going to be changes, I'm told by a, a, a physicist, there will be changes to the laws of thermodynamics, but for now, they are tremendously useful and practical until we find out something better. Um, so, I, I hope I've not uh, ridden roughshod over Karl Popper's work. Um, Someone had to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Breathings were really common um, as a treatment, um, and now the same thing is called self-harm. But do they both? Are these languages within cultures, historical cultures, for tapping into what is actually an experience? Well, you you will know this because I have on my desk at home a model, a skull of a phrenology yeah. map. Which was big in Edinburgh, of course, wasn't it? So, yeah, it's all within a particular time and culture. So, what is science? It depends on other things. Well, and that's not denying science completely either. It's just saying, I think we need to hold it with our own touch. But what, what you alluded to was, you know, that people talk about scientific laws, and technically speaking, there are no scientific laws, there are only scientific hypotheses which are supported or not supported by evidence and may change as time goes by. So talking about them as laws is misleading, and at least a misleading concept of what science is. People assume that science is a set of answers, and the quotation I often have is that it's not actually a way of uh, answering your questions, it's a way of questioning your answers. <laughs> I don't uh, get that, but it's good, good night. Uh, and, and, you know, the point is that, that uh, you know, as time goes by, all these things may change. Uh, and that, that science is not an outcome, it's a methodology. It's a way of looking for answers. It's not actually the answers themselves. Yeah, and, and I, th I think if we look at law, law changes over time too. It is specific to, to cultures, at the times, and uh, I think Darius the Great was uh, uh, one one of the early uh, thinkers who, who laid out a set of universal rights. And there, there's an anecdote where he brought uh, one one representative from one culture, the far reach of the, of the empire, and and a representative from another, and he brought them into the room together, and he said, okay, now, can I ask you, what would you think of the morality of uh, when, when your, your, your uh, relatives die, we bury them in the ground? And I, I can I ask you, about when your relatives die, we eat them. And both of them were aboard. One went, oh, bury, bury your relatives in the ground, how sacrilegious. And the other went, eat your relatives? How sacrilegious. But if you're Mexican, you dig them up and you dance with them on November the 1st. <laughs> So, so this, this brings in a sense of culture and time 
an epoch. And, and uh, in my mind, I, I, talk, uh, I, th I think of, right, there's human theatre. So there's argumentation, there's uh, um, rhetoric, and there's aristics. Aristic being uh, saying anything, you know, lying through your teeth to win an argument. Um, and that constitutes, well, anyway. Um, uh, but there's something that's not of the, uh, human culture. So let's think about a practical example of a light touch of science. I read that aspirin lowers my temperature. And I know that, you know, the, the mega pharma companies are making so much money that there are problems. They're introducing, uh, you know, there, there have been incidences, situations where uh, they've lied through their teeth about getting a product sold. Um, but thinking about aspirin, can I test this? What, what capacity do I have to test this? So one, I can buy acetosinic acid, aspirin in the, the shop. I can also go to the white willow tree and I can strip off some bark and I can make a, uh, an extraction, aspirin coming from white willow bark. I can wait for a temperature and I, that gives me an opportunity to test, to create an experiment. Okay, I'm boiling, I'm boiling up and I'm using an instrument. So, uh, you know, a mercury thermometer or a digital thermometer. My temperature is this. I take this and I can measure the differences in temperature and document these. And that gives me an anecdote. And because if I document how I've done this, I can then so say to somebody else, well, this, this may be useful in terms of when people have dangerous temperatures. This, this might be useful as a tool in medicine. Um, and, and in psychiatry, I think there's, there's a, there are a lot of corrections going on with uh, how, as I understand it, changes in moods, behavior, and cognition are responded to, especially with drugs. Placebo uh, effect. The placebo effect, uh, and, and some of the, you know... Placebos are real, they work, don't they? They're clinical studies. They work exceptionally well, yes. yes. And it, it's, it's one of our... I could get into psychology in more depth, but I mean, one of the things well, that, 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 that uh, has been very criticised about psychology in terms of psychology's claim to be a science, which I believe it is, because it uses methodology, which is scientific methodology, but people have been critical of a lot of the way in which it produces results. And it's been known as the replication crisis, that if you actually attempt to repeat psychological experiments, you don't always get the same result. Uh, and one of the things about that is that there is an element there which is unpredictable, and that's people. <laughs> and you're, if you're doing a chemical experiment, you have a chemical, and you do something that's entirely predictable with that chemical, and you get a result that's likely to lead to a high degree of replication. If you're doing the same sorts of experiments with people, you have to take into account, what did they have for breakfast this morning? Did their cousin just die of pneumonia? Yeah. <laughs> because these things will actually change the way in which the reaction occurs, and therefore whether or not you're going to get a predictable, replicable result. And so there's actually been a question about whether in terms of looking at some of these things that are inherently highly unpredictable, whether replicability in the scientific approach is that, or the scientific approach as we currently understand it, is the best way of attempting to find out what's really going on. Well, and well, drugs are another good example of that. What would be the alternative to the scientific approach to that falsifiability, to that kind of empirical testing? Well, I think you know. As I say, I, I basically have a scientific point of view. I mean, I've always been a scientist. I started off doing maths and physics before I went to do psychology. Jesus Christ, said But I believe Jesus that you, know, you, you actually have to, to be prepared to, to see that things are not neatly going to fall into the 
categories and we sometimes have to see that things are more complex and that the, the sort of simplistic predictability of sometimes the scientific method is not going to work in some situations. Well, obviously that, that, that would be the correct uh, approach, but I don't know, I mean, psychologists, they fall out all the time, don't they? They have so many different, you know, two, two psychologists in a room, you get three different opinions, the old joke. Uh, but Freud, Jung, Adler, they were completely at odds all the time. And yeah, so well, I think it's a lot completely kind of wrong, but that's another story. That yeah. forest. But that, that happens in all sciences. I mean, that, that's, that's happening in, in absolutely everything. I mean, one of the things that came up recently, for example, was that there was a 25-year bet about whether or not we would understand the meaning or, or how consciousness works. And there was a neurologist who placed this bet with a philosopher 25 years ago, and the neurologist said, well, it's all going to be proved by science. We're going to work it out. We're going to show how it all works. Well, 25 years ago. Roger, Roger Penrose thinks all to do with kind of uh, well, the point quantum is dynamics in the brain. The neurologist lost the bet because 25 years later, and it came up this year, we still don't know how consciousness works. So they've actually done the bet again. Oh, for right. the next 25 years, and the philosopher's laughing, and he said, <laughs> if the neurologist thinks he's going to be able to sort that out in the next 25 years, he's got another thing coming. Because some things are just so complex that, that you know, even trying to apply scientific methodology well, they're, they're, isn't always the answer. They are complex, but they are so obvious as well. We all think we are conscious. Well, even though we can't do explain, that even we can't explain it. <laughs> I was going to say that philosophers have been arguing for thousands of years about what consciousness is, and it's still up for debate, isn't it? So. Yeah. <laughs> it might be completely, you know, ephemeral, you know. So, so to, to to recap some of the sorry, I interrupted. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, very much why you know what I get. From, from doing this is being, you know, uh, privy, you know, getting involved in these discussions. And I, I, I really like learning and uh, education in that, in this context, because it enriches my world. It helps me, you're helping me epistemologically error check and also go, away and go, oh, well, there's all this that I've got to read up on. And, and, you know, you're helping me to think. And science as a collective endeavor, I, I feel very strongly about. It's only through a sort of collegiality that we manage to get at the, the gestalt capacities of, of human beings. So the, the gestalt being everything that's more than just the sum of its parts. So my response to, uh, I think it's the prisoner's dilemma, mm -hmm. is, yeah, I'm gonna work with people because my, our capacities uh, geometrically expand because we're in a relationship uh, isolating myself, I'm I'm creating very bounded capacities. So it's like rather than, uh, well, I'm not going to read anything because I'm going to learn everything just first hand. Well, there, there's something valuable about books, and people put a lot of time and uh, care into their books, and there are different motives for writing, you know. And as I practice and, and de develop a theory of mind, you know, try and see things from another perspective, uh, I, you know, I found that really helpful uh, in, in all kinds of applications. Um, so sci scientific knowledge m must be testable and independently repeatable. So, Going back, there are different types of knowledge, and there are various arguments that go over, uh, go on about different disciplines. So, sociology, for example, uh, uh, is 
you know, part of the humanities and often gets described as soft subject rather than a hard subject. But, um, you know, due to the complexity of the universe and our experience and the varying factors, we, we need something more than just scientific knowledge. Because like uh, John Maynard Keynes spoke about, uh, well, th there are lots of non-homogeneous uh, phenomena. And we've got tools for measuring uh, homogeneous you know, phenomena. But what, how are we dealing with things that change in their nature? Like, you know, the, 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 the multiple and evolving aspect of the human mind and experience. It doesn't mean that that knowledge is less valuable. An interesting one is, is that there's a lot of leaning on, it's not true if there's not a double blind crossover placebo control longitudinal study so we're not going to discuss it. Now, I've never seen any trials suggesting that water is a good treatment for dehydration. I, I want to see the evidence base before we use it. But, well, the, there are other types of knowledge. I think, I think people talking in deserts is pretty good. <laughs> well... Show me the study. <laughs> you know, so there's a we we can fetishize cultures. Well, uh, I say the same about air and breathing. Oh, indeed, and, and I've met people who who swear blind they don't need food or sleep or air, and I've not seen them. I, 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 mad American. I, I would I you know <laughs> expand my horizons. Show show me an instance of this, and I will revise my my model. But uh, I'm not going to bring that idea central. No, stop breathing. Because, well, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, think about the time, the, the changing paradigms uh, and how things uh, move. Uh, I've got a, a bit of a riff on um, uh, atoms. <laughs> so, we go back in time, and the notion of at, at, atoms goes a long, long way back. You can date it to... Greece. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, the, at what's an atom? It's uh, the smallest unit. And they were looking for units and you know, running away. Well, there's uh, everything is a combination of earth, air, fire, and water. I think the Chinese... Uh, uh, also have metal in as a constellation. Well, that's, that that was one code. You know, those are codifications. Those are systems or models they used to rationalize and make you know reason their experience in the universe. Um, and uh, they, they're also stable forms. These, these units are stable forms. Um, and uh, I think that's, you know, that's questionable, actually. I think physicists argue about that. Well, uh, so think about the. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was sitting there shaking my yeah. head behind you. Well, if, a duck, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and flies like a duck, is it valid to call it a duck until you're, you find, you know, and I remember reading through a book of metaphysics uh, discussing the differences between a duck and a wooden duck. What is different? What is duckness? Uh, and, and <laughs> every, every wood. <laughs> so, so this really, I, I think, is a beautiful illustration of um, how how we understand, at any point, given point in time, we understand far less than we think we understand. So, for example, you know, so the understanding of, of an atom has come a 
huge distance over yeah. the last couple of thousand years. And I, you know, I I thought I I thought I understood atoms pretty well until I saw a Nature article describing atoms as the most complex thing that anyone could imagine. With and it looked it showed the inside of an atom and it looked like a mini universe. Oh, and, 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 and so, so we've gone from having a plum pudding model about a hundred years ago to well, now we're we're yes, full things. At, well, and, and a thousand years ago it was a fundamental particle or whatever. We've gone from that to now this whole new concept of an atom which is almost like a mini universe inside it. Well, that's interesting because it was like, a, like the electron spinning round. Well, yeah. yeah, then we went to the gap we from plum pudding to a, a galaxy type model, and now it, it's actually, it looks inside well, it's like it's down the to universe it. moving inside it. It's We're incredible. Broken, broken down to electrons, neutrons, and protons. Yeah. And then that was subdivided, of course, into quarks. Yeah. Strangeness and charm. Yeah, so, which are now, you know, they're so, subdivisions. Very good things. So, so, yeah, so, so the point that I was trying James, to make James is that in, in the, within the space of the last couple of months, I've seen atoms that look like mini universes, each and every one of them in their own right. Um, I've I've been reading about black holes and you know talking, saying, well, actually, um, at the start of the universe, particles were moving at such high energies that quarks and antiquarks and electrons, and all the forces, were all interchangeable. Yeah, and all the forces were the same. Yeah. And, and actually, that over, as particles go over the event horizon of a black hole, the that force. the energies are about the same as they were at the start of the universe. So if we accept that particles are interchangeable, that um, quantum theory says that everything that is possible, everything that could happen, is happening all at once everywhere. So particles are interchangeable, everything that could be happening is happening. Gödel's theory says that you know if you think something is true, if yes, then no. <laughs> so actually, what what is understanding? I think we well, we use science to help us navigate a way through a universe that is completely ununderstandable, but it's the best we've got, and it's amazing. I think that's great. That's great. <laughs> well, that, that's that's true. Not. But yeah, I was saying yeah. to Alex earlier on that the quantum which you've raised you know, is a real challenge to science because yes. it comes up with completely counterintuitive answers well, to things. No one really like things it. can be in two places at the same time. And well, think, well, what Einstein how, called how spooky, spooky attraction at a distance. Well, that's right. Yeah, that's what yeah. Einstein called it, spooky attraction at a distance. Yeah. But, you know, all these things, and they're completely counterintuitive. And so they're saying, oh, hang on, if it's completely counterintuitive, how do you set about using science to actually prove these things, you know, are they actually almost in this, by definition, outside science? And as a mathematician, you'll, you'll be familiar with the Gödel incompleteness theorem. Yeah, right. so we've talked about this already. If yes, yeah, I've mentioned if that yes already. then no. <laughs> <laughs> if no, then yes. So, you know, it, it is the best we've got. And I have to say, I don't like dividing all the sciences up into different disciplines. I think we specialise too much. I think the way to navigate this very complex universe is to almost go back to the approach that I have in classical times where we, we our minds are free range <laughs> and we take it all along with philosophy all together. Well, you've prefigured this whole vignette. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no, 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 not at all. Uh, I, I mean, this, this is the, I mean, I, I wanted to start to the, from these ancient sort of conceptual schemes and sort of go through how they've changed and think about how the the tools the so um uh the t development of tools like glass glass lenses gave rise to magnification and for the first time people could see really small things in more detail and and you 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 got people going uh why are these holes appearing in my cloth and well, and so they, they then developed magnification more. You know, uh, Robert Hooke started, you know, brought the, the uh, early microscope together and went, look, if, when you look through this, there's a, a 
a, a, a world visible uh, the, the naked eye cannot see. And poof, the model was disrupted. And optics uh, developed further and greater and greater levels of magnification to, to the point where, uh, you know, uh, uh, incidentally, just the, the reason why holes were appearing in cloth were well, because there were little little living things eating the material. This is like Paris with the bed bugs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just well, to the side. And suddenly we could see the cause. There was a cause, uh, a different account of what the effect we were seeing. And as the tools develop, we can see more and they force us, they challenge our old models and they, they force us to find new, more representative models. So let's think about how long the electron microscope has been around. I, you mentioned, I, th I think, the, the, the Rutherford atom. So, you know, oh, well, you know, moving from, was it Mendeleev uh, who did, who organized the periodic table? They were going, right, okay, well, there's pure substances. These are all pure substances. And he started organizing them into a, a pattern. And he went, ah, uh, well, according to this pattern, there's a whole number of pure substances that are going to be discovered from here. I really love the fact that when you look at photographs of them and see the state... Was that the uh, was that uh, the yeah. the P pods the genetics or Mendel Mendel, Mendel yeah, yeah. yeah right so he was a priest too right? yeah Mendel well opt optics that came from uh, monasteries sciences came out of scholastic uh, study and thinking and discussion um, and. Uh, the periodic table developed and then there was like, oh, well, we've got the, the fundamental floor on reality. And they went, well, no, 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 no. There's, there's electrons, there's neutrons and there's protons. And then, of course, the development of quantum theory and the, 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 the tool in CERN. You know, you know, well, it's smashing particles together and, and they can image in, is it, uh, oh, there's a new subdivision of time they've got to uh, attoseconds. I don't know, but you know, you go down to milliseconds and picoseconds, and then there you are know, hundreds of those, and you can image things more readily. Um, but even on a large scale, I mean, one of the technologies that's, that's developed is astral telescopes. You know, the, the, the new telescope that's up, that's perceiving things in the universe at the same. That should not be happening. It's too yeah. old for <laughs> the established age of the universe, isn't yeah. it? You've yeah, yeah. But the, the, they're looking at various actions that are going on that we can now see more clearly. They say that should not be happening according to our current theories of science and understanding. That can't be there. But we're looking at it. It is there. <laughs> So, you know, we have to develop yet again. And that's on the macro scale, never mind the micro scale. And we have to be capable of managing paradox and, and not being so attached to a model that we can't move to a new model uh, or question the old ones. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, another thing it was uh, interestingly, Voltaire wrote about these scientific discoveries in in, in his work. Uh, uh, you know, think about Robert Hooke suddenly saying all these alien things we've never seen before, and they exist all over us, all around us, all the time. Now you can imagine some people will have been very very worried. Some people have said, complete nonsense, this guy's a charlatan and a fraud. And other people, and again, would have gone, can you show us evidence 
of this place. And more people repeated it. You know, you've got people like uh, Baruch Spinoza in Amsterdam grinding lenses and going off and writing for, uh, his philosophy. And, you know, how, how does he try to understand the universe? And it's a collective endeavor to, to make comparisons, to be in discussion and dialogue. Uh, I, I, I feel all of this is a part of our everyday lives. Uh, it, it's an essential part of our well-being, our happiness. It, it makes the world richer with the, the information we, we gain and glean from each other. Uh, just one observation there. I mean, yes, it is a collective endeavour to some extent, but also science, you know more, that, more than I do, uh, is desperately competitive. <laughs> Well, I'm going to come on to a, a whole section of scholarly yeah. foibles and uh, scholarly... Preference for publishing positive results. So, preference for publishing positive results. Yeah, well, peer review is kind of a really dodgy thing. There's a thing called the, uh, the Matthew effect mm. for the book of Matthew. To them that have it shall be given. If you've got lots of papers published, you get, get it published even more easily. So, so let, 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 let's... Drill into human, human, uh, you know, human and scholarly politics and foibles. Uh, if well, we know that uh, the a range of perspectives are held. We know that uh, we're. It, it, it's a comfortable idea to find a consensus, a single answer. For everything, but and and scientific method of uh, alludes to ways of error checking, and um, I I'm really interested in that, that that knowledge building and the distinction between skepticism and pseudo skepticism has been really interesting. And uh, Professor Marcello Truzzi uh, uh, wrote the, what, what he felt were the distinctions, what, what makes pseudo-skepticism, which often looks like skepticism, a false, uh, false version of skepticism. Um, so he, he suggests that uh, Denying when only doubt has been established is one key principle of uh, pseudo-skepticism. Uh, double standards in the application of criticism, he suggests, as another. The tendency to discredit rather than investigate. Presenting insufficient evidence or proof Assuming criticism requires no burden of proof. Making unsubstantiated counterclaims. Counterclaims based on plausibility rather than empir empirical evidence. And suggesting that unconvincing evidence provides grounds for completely dis dismissing a claim. And on the back of that, I'm going to bring in into the conversation a, a really interesting problem called the Kingsbury problem. Arthur Kingsbury was a geologist. He spent, uh, he had a long and industrious career going all over the world, going, I found this mineral here, this rock there, you know, oh, this is fantastic. And he was, he was regarded very much top of his field until it, somebody worked out, you know, some of his samples he's lied through his teeth about. Now, by this time, he had furnished museums, academic departments, whole careers had been based on his work because it was assumed, you know, the, oh, well, it's, it's Arthur Kinsbury. He's, he's, I'm going to take that 
without question, and that's the authoritative truth. And the Kingsbury problem now is going back through all these collections and working out the falsification he, he was involved with. Because some of his work was absolutely true. You know, you find great smoky quartz in the... In, uh, Middle East Scotland, uh, you find, yeah, but some of the things he was lying through his teeth about. And that's where we are. Uh, I, th I think th there's a, like you mentioned, Trump saying there's alternative facts. <laughs> uh, and there, there are cultures uh, of, of, which are solipsistic. If I believe this enough, it's all true. You know, that's what makes uh, reality the force of will, the, the what, you know, I manifest my reality. And that becomes self referential, referential when you're only referencing your own ideas. So I just wanted to point out that this is something that um, it has over hundreds of years been fairly widespread actually. More, 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 wide, more widespread yeah, well, than, 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 than we would realise. So the biggest example, example recently, with, well, like the last couple of decades, is Andrew Wakefield. Uh, well, I mean, I went, to, uh, I went to a Royal Institution lecture last night on genetics. It was called Standing on the Shoulders of Prejudice. I took a photo, I took a photo a of, work, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was amazing, um, that the, the, the Halden Prize, and the, 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 the chap who was giving the talk, uh, Adam Rutherford, put a, put a slide up, which was a photo, no, it, I don't think so actually, but he put a slide up for a geneticist who actually worked in Edinburgh, very famous, um, a, a chap called R.A. Fisher. And in 1958, because he was so famous and so esteemed by the establishment, he was also a smoker. And he, he put, publicized all around the world, the change over recent decades gives not the least ev evidence of being due to increasing consumption of tobacco. Now, by 1930, evidence abandoned <laughs> of the dangers of tobacco and that it, it caused cancer. This is, he, this is something that he said in 1958. We can't tell much about the absolute magnitude of this secular change. It's certain that radiology has facilitated the detection of lung cancer enormously, so the detection's improved. Nothing to do with smoking. So the detection's so, improved, but the causality has not been, has not been proved. No, but, not been but, 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 but the point was that because he he was so well regarded in the scientific community and indeed still is to this day. Really? Um, yeah, he still is to this day actually. Oh, yeah. Um, but <laughs> he he essentially allowed a, an approach by putting that out there into the public domain, he put out an approach that where there is sufficient doubt, you know, we not all scientists agree. <laughs> and therefore we can justify to sell cigarettes, you know? Well, so, and, and that approach carries on through to this day, actually. We see the climate change. Well, this well is I'm sure there's an element about yeah. mention that, exactly the same thing with climate change. Yeah, I talked earlier on about the experimenter effect, and that is, you know, that when people are doing experiments and attempting to find proof, it's a person who's doing that, and it's not actually a completely isolated scientific event. You know, there are people involved in doing it, uh, and there's been loads of criticism of various people down through the years about you know, the facts that they supposedly came up with. In some cases, it's been shown they definitely falsified the results. Sometimes they falsified it by creating false results. Sometimes they falsified it by ignoring outliers uh, and uh, you know, the use of statistics to, to narrow the field, as it were, and, and attempt to prove. Sometimes they were doing it quite deliberately. Sometimes they weren't. Sometimes they believed they were doing exactly the right thing and were carrying out the experiment in the right way, but they had such a strong belief 
about what was appropriate or not appropriate in the outcome of that experiment. They chose to focus on one range of things rather than another range of things. But that, that is, you know, as a psychologist, a fascinating thing to me when it comes to actually looking at how science works. Science is not independent, it's carried out by people. Absolutely. <laughs> and there's you know, huge amounts of fraud. Yeah. And you mentioned Mendel earlier, you know, a lot of his kind of work on genetics was completely fraudulent. Mm -hmm. You know, he was carrying out the diktats of the, the Soviet estate. Well, uh, this, this is why I, I, I think the, the understanding of scientific methods in our thinking, uh, you know, we, we need to take, I liked your, your, your thought on, you know, take science with a light touch and we're bringing, we've got to continue always to bring scrutiny and it's a good practice anyway because by scrutinizing something, you you learn the inner workings of the thing that you're studying. But you might also arrive at the, the understanding, oh, well, this person has written a completely fraudulent paper. Their references don't even, you know, they, they're citing all of these papers, or, and some of these papers don't corroborate their, their narrative. So, so the testability aspect, I think, should we should understand as extending in the lit, in literature. Um, talking about some, you you, you bring nicely onto uh, human foibles in genetics. So, what's <laughs> <laughs> what's wrong? What what do you think is right or wrong about this statement? The central dogma is information comes from the molecule but does not go to the molecule. If, if we're thinking about scientific... I have no methods, idea what you're talking about. Okay. In, in genetics, it was a statement made in genetics by Francis Crick. And Francis Crick stated uh, explicitly... Yeah, yeah so uh, Crick and Watson were... Uh, uh, attributed the Nobel Prize for uh, showing the structure, the double helix structure of the DNA, All right? So I'm going to work through a few problems with Mr. Crick. <laughs> Apart from nicking all his ideas from... Uh, that being one. Franklin. Yes. Uh, so he, he made this statement. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. You do not get dogmas in science. Dogma is not a part of science. Mm, I, I, I would disagree, actually. I mean, I mean, into that lecture last night, and some of the scientists that I respected, who actually, from their own political viewpoint and prejudices, went out and looked for things that corroborated their prejudices, and then used them for eugenics. <laughs> are, are, are you, do you still regard them as scientists? Well. In, in the strictest sense, yes, they were. They were going about their science. And do I regard them as good scientists? Okay. No. Okay, right. But, but then that is my subjective opinion based on my worldviews, of course. And people who share their worldviews would say, yes, of course they were good scientists. So this is the point. That we're all, we, we are all it, subject to our own subjectivity. And we're all about to corroborate our Science worldviews. is not an absolute. It's simply our our way of achieving the best guess we can make at any given time. Exactly. But what, what, what you're saying is interesting because, you know, you talk about eugenics, and actually that is a kind of a huge worldview which just informs people's science. Yes. You know, and they look for stuff that uh, kind of corroborates it. So, and it was amazing last night, actually, I was listening to uh, some statements made by you know, Winston Churchill and, and very well-regarded scientists who were sort of just eugenics, yes, yes absolutely. Was, yes. Um, but, but, you know, also going right down to, particularly the English scientists, very keen on weeding out lower classes and, <laughs> you know, so it, 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 not just race, but feeble-minded, whatever that means, you know. 
So mm -hmm. it, it was all about their own worldview that shaped their perception and they used their science, whether whether consciously or unconsciously, you'll be all aware, I'm sure, of unconscious bias. They went out and they looked mm -hmm. for things that corroborated their own worldview. And it's quite interesting to see the differences in what that worldview looks like based on different nationalities of scientists. In, in Britain, it was more around class prejudice. And yeah. In, Still in, is. In, yeah. <laughs> there was a big thing in, in, in Australia, wasn't there, about breeding out blackness of the of Aboriginal peoples, you know, by getting white-skinned Aboriginals yeah. to breed with white people. Well, that's the other thing about, you know, what does that yeah, actually yeah, mean? Right. So, because, I mean, the, one of the ones that, that uh, certainly in my early days studying psychology that was a big issue was racial differences in intelligence. Isaac got into a lot of trouble with that, for example. Who? Had, I think Hans Einstein, oh, right. the, the uh, psychologist, the yeah. famous <laughs> psychologist. But, I mean, the interesting thing is that, that you know, if you use standard intelligence tests and you measure intelligence across different racial groups, there are differences in the mean scores, and that's a fact. But what does that fact mean? Well, IQ tests are kind of really problematic. Aren't well, they? You one, know one thing is, is you know, are the tests themselves biased? And it's been suggested that the tests were actually biased to Western educated people yes. and were going to measure certain kinds of things that would not necessarily be there. But the other thing, too, is even if you look at the statistics, although the means might be different, the standard deviations were so great that actually knowing which race somebody belonged to told you absolutely nothing about what their intelligence was likely to be. So these statistical occurrences, although they were scientifically accurate, were actually totally meaningless. Uh, and so that's one of the difficulties that again comes down in science, that getting the information is one thing, working out what it means may be a whole different ballgame. And also challenging ourselves about our own yeah. biases that we're bringing into the work that we do. I mean, some of this, of course, all the way back Plato's time. <laughs> you know, Plato did this whole, whole categorization of, you know, different rulers and different approaches to science. And obviously, of course, the end result of that from this incredible thinker mm -hmm. was that the world needed philosopher king. Well, funny that a philosopher should say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is the thing, we, yeah, we, we, it, this problem of not always challenging their own viewpoints it's goes back like, a very long way. It's a bit like our own king, big champion of hereditary ruling. <laughs> 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 uh, I, so, yeah, this, this checking process is absolutely vital. Is, is vital that everybody is involved in that. And in terms of going back to the, the story of DNA, I, I've never read anywhere uh, about scientific method that dogmas are a part of scientific method. But people carry dogmas. People, uh, you know, and Crick, demonstrated bad science, therefore created uh, distortions in understanding. And as we, as time... Explain that a little bit, because how did it, was it bad science? How did it create distortions? Okay, so, so uh, information... It's a great breakthrough. So there was, the, 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 we've had to go through a whole culture of corrections to this central dogma. So, he said, this is the unshakable fundamental. No, no, no evidence can change this because it's a dogma. That's you know, my explanation of dogma. Information, you know, we're looking at DNA, and information comes from the molecule, but does not go to the molecule. Okay, so, so let's, let's think how that pans out. So e evolution is a random process. So we get ran language like random mutations and junk DNA and the, the irrelevance of, of, of an environment. And then we get 
corrections in epigenetics, going, ah, well, no, no, we used to think that. But junk DNA is not junk. It's doing things. We, and and the, the better scientists frame things in, well, we don't quite understand what's going on here. And there's good, you know, so Crick was using categorical statements. Uh, he was uh, full of bravado. He eventually got sacked from the Human, human Genome Project for racism. Uh, he, he had an ego the size of uh, you know, Jupiter, he declaring himself the, the most brilliant mind of, of, this, of the last 200 years. And he, like you pointed out, he pinched the work Rosalind of Rosalind Franklin, Franklin yeah. who was doing this digitally, uh, sorry, diligent work in uh, imaging the structure of DNA. And they... She voiced it herself in the process. They, they even uh, had their chemistry, fundamental chemistry, corrected by a friend in the pub. So they, I don't think they were good thinkers. And, and to, to go to, to point out what Professor Nowicki points out, they weren't, it wasn't just them two blokes. There was a whole human theater of patriarchal thing, uh, line management going on, because departmentally, Rosalind Franklin was told, you stop your work. This work is theirs, that's an end to it. And she was feisty and unfortunately, uh, well, she, fortunately she carried on her work. Unfortunately, she, she, she died. Uh, and we need these corrections of stories of these accounts because uh, there, there's another, you know, people have been written out of discovery and science. Um, and uh, is anybody familiar with Eunice Newton Foote? Yeah. That's a great name. Who, 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 who laid the foundations for understandings uh, of global warming? Eunice Newton Foote in. Uh, she lived 1819 to 1888, and she published the first papers on the effects of gases, you know, and heat variations on the planet. And uh, biases uh, against crediting women scientists for their work led to a lack of documentation. Uh, about her contributions and scientific achievements, and she fell into obscurity. Um, and oh, this... I've never heard of her. <laughs> no, I'm just looking her up just now. <laughs> I mean, we, we find this again and again. Uh, the, um, Mary Allen, have you come across Mary Allen? She sells seashells on the seashore. Oh, she was a paleontologist. She laid the foundations. Oh. Is, is she not in that film, um, the the Ammonite? Oh, I'll yes. look that up. Yeah, yeah that's her, yeah, isn't cool. it? It's a, it's yes. a great film. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, she was utterly <laughs> marginalised, yet she built, you know, not significant. Not significant. <laughs> <laughs> she significantly created the foundations of a subject field. Um, and uh, I, I like the quote, uh, th th this is a, a bit from uh, a book called, uh, written by Andrew Robbins, uh, Robinson, uh, Lost Languages and the Enigma of the World's Undeciphered Scripts. Fantastic book. Um, the Nobel what Prize, Sorry, you said the name of that book again? Uh, Lost Languages. Andrew <laughs> Robinson. Andrew Robinson, thank you. Classic, um, classic speech. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, books are great. <laughs> the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman tried his hand at deciphering 
Mayan numerals and calendars just for the fun of it. He knew he was not the first. And it's a drummer as well, wasn't he? Oh, he was also a safe breaker. Really? Oh, he was a safe <laughs> it's a brilliant man. <laughs> uh, he was not, uh, he, he knew he was not the first and said, you get one hell of an excitement, just like a physics uh, discovery or something. And I, interest, I'm very interested in uh, Michael Ventra. So what, motiv what, what might motivate somebody like Arthur Kingsbury to lie? Well, status and money can really distort some people's uh, com you know, moral, uh, ethical compasses. Oh, well, I'm just going to lie because I really love the attention. Uh, and, and money is a, a fine incentive for some people to, to lie through their teeth about uh, their work. Uh, Michael Ventris is fa uh, the famous amateur decipherer of Linear B, which for a long time was this mysterious uh, dead language. And he, uh, he, he, worked out the, the decipherment and that was corroborated. And when he was asked, he said, uh, how did you do this? How did you do this? And he said, well, it wasn't me. It was, I, I was in the right place at the right time and we had the right, there, was, there were enough samples. I just happened to know ancient Greek. <laughs> and so he gave proper attribution to all of the work he was bringing together and illustrated it was a collective endeavor. And he has a lovely, he had a lovely um, uh, expression now, um, undeciphered scripts. Uh, the Easter Island Rongo Rongo scholar, Jacques Guy, unceremoniously declares are uh, powerful cook attractors. Sometimes a successful decipherer of one script gets it into their head that they can decipher other scripts and they become cranks. A fear which seems to have haunted Michael Ventris. And that kept him from tackling Linear A after his success with Linear B. Also his early death might have had something to do. <laughs> yeah, poor guy got, uh, died in a car crash very shortly after. Uh, but. Um, one, one of the truths of the archaeological decipherment is that it attracts both geniuses and cranks. Uh, and it is not always easy to tell, tell apart. In the pursuit of such analytical exercises, Ventris considered it important to bear in mind, is this fantasy, coincidence, or circular reasoning? And I, again, here is somebody making an imperative of questioning, oh, this fits, this, this suits me, but I need, I need to work out whether I'm convincing myself or not convincing myself. I was under the impression that the, those were translated by virtue of the Rosetta Stone. The, the Rosetta Stone. Which was kind of a, you know, a translation of yeah. the linear B and A scripts. It was he was working on the Rosetta Stone, and they were they they knew that they were comparators, and uh, Ventris, like he said, I I just happened to know ancient Greek. The other scholars happened not to. <laughs> they had, they knew a heck of a lot otherwise. But I really directed to Robinson's book is just a treasure. Really, even if you're not interested in decipherment or linguistics or texts, it's it's a, a, a fantastic history of how written and spoken language has evolved through the ages. Um, so, and also how science used to be presented in prose. So oh, science used well, to be like presented. That. Prose. You said Latin. Yes. So like Lucretius. Well, like first of all, gave his thanks to the muses and, and the amazing prose. And, and again, 
that comes back to that early time before we had writing, the scientists looked for the things that are, are, are in the oral tradition, a way to try and get knowledge to stick in the memory and be communicable to others and rhyme with them. <laughs> Well. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's why so many things in, in classical times, even after the advent of writing, they were written in prose. Mm -hmm. Written in verse. Sorry, written in verse. A apparently, Apollo's lyre, each string of the lyre represented a vowel. So, pre the development of written vowels that you see in some languages in terms of pointing, marks above and below. We see in English, in, in Middle English, you know, all the various kind of language, various words and letters that we've lost, like the suck, you know, like the old whatever is actually pronounced. No. But yeah. So. Oh, I'm showing off now. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm good. I, I don't know much about Old English, uh, but I, I know enough about English to know it's the ultimate mongrel. <laughs> it's. <laughs> It's a it's smash French. bag of all different languages. French, Latin, you know, Saxon. Yeah, a bit of that, yeah. Lots of it, I think. So, and Persian. Yeah, no, I didn't know. Persian. Persian. Where did that come from? So, well, they never invaded, did they? Well, the caravans. Ah, oh, caravans, wow. right. Yeah, there are lots of examples in the English language of Persian. So that would have come through travellers. I don't know. <laughs> I just know there are lots of examples. So I'll, I'll finish that, this anecdote, and I've got one more one more piece on the the theat human theatre to add to the human foibles that, that act as it can act as distortions. Or um, um, so so yeah. The, I mentioned the Paulus Leo. So. Historically, written language was consonantal base. And the interpretation of the consonants was brought to life when it was spoken. So the vowels were spoken, and hence the Apollo's lyre represented the lineage of this is how we remember it, and this is how we give specific meaning to these these inscriptions. So the, the the word for rose and lily in Hebrew are written the same way, ancient Hebrew, because there's no vowels. And it's the interpretation, it's the context that shapes it. So to, 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 finish, to finish this conversation and discussion, I'm going, going to touch on uh, something that uh, Professor Arthur Dykeman uh, a professor of psychology who studied um, cults and uh, the one of his last books he, he, he wrote was The Wrong Way Home the uh, and, and he, he this was examining he, he took all of his learning and he said we've got to have a discussion about everyday life. Because we think about cult behaviours as very rarefied, often happening to people who aren't good thinkers or who are vulnerable. And he, was, he said, but not so. And in his book, The Wrong Way Home, he he's talking about the characteristics of cult behaviour that run through society. And that we should be aware of, because when we're aware of these things, we can make corrections for them. The four key posits that he puts together as coalescing into cult-like behavior are compliance with the group, dependence on a leader, devaluating, devaluing the outsider, and avoiding dissent. And he uses anecdotes from everyday life to illustrate these characteristics. And one of them, um, he brings together is the story from the history of medicine, 
from, uh, and that's of the 19th century Hungarian physician uh, Semmelweis. Um, so Semmelweis was uh, in. He was. He, he said to his colleagues, "Wait a minute." We're moving from operating theatre to operating theatre. What we need to do is sterilise our hands between operations. Because we're transferring infection from one patient to another and we're losing too many people. Because before that, surgeons would wash their hands after cutting up the patients just to get <laughs> blood off their hands and that kind of thing. Now, the, the tragedy. Doctors are still dirty. Very heavy smokers in the past, that's all I remember. It's, uh, the, the BBC have done a great programme on uh, Semmelweis, and the terrible truth of the matter is that his profession went you're a crank, you're a nut, this is rubbish, and he got profoundly depressed and uh, ended up taking his life. And the, these, these stories remind us that these group think, these group dynamics do take place. And it, it's also, it's not necessarily that something is right means that it, gets recognised. We've got people like James Lind, Chief Surgeon of the, the Navy, saying, wait a minute, people are dying of this scurvy thing, but I don't think it's an infectious thing. I think we can treat it with citrus fruits. So we need to ration all of our uh, Navy with citrus fruits. Now, the, if you look at the amount of time it took for his, it, how, how testable is that? You know, it's like washing the hands. You don't need to put a hell of a lot of effort into testing that, but it took many decades for for Lin, Lin's work to be operationalized, and to this day. Uh, That's why British sailors became known as limeys. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, uh, you know, there, there, there are so many stories like this, but uh, I, I... Sorry, I'm just going to say that that's one of the things I think people need to bear in mind when they judge scientists who sometimes aren't brave enough or sometimes go too far and, you know, do things... <laughs> um, you know, or make bold statements that perhaps they shouldn't. You know, they are human beings, social creatures, subject to all the same peer pressures that we've all grown up with. Um, but what I would say is that the way that their work is funded has traditionally been funded. How they do that and live their lives and raise families in that uncertain environment where they have funding for a year or two and they don't know what's going to happen after that. It's always short-term funding and the universities can kick them out on their ear at the end of it. So making a name for themselves, the long the day and their family's stability and livelihoods are predicated on protecting their name protecting their achievements, getting out there and getting the positive results that are required by journals. So it's very easy for us with stable jobs to look at that and <laughs> criticise, but actually there are a whole host of human social factors at play in their lives as well. Well, it's not just true of science, it's, it's, it's true of every academic discipline. Yes, you know, they're just jostling for funding the whole time. Just well, interesting. Public, public we we're talking about cults and what drives cults. Just throw a slight curveball in. I mean, uh, science is a great enemy. Faith. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and some, some people will say, I don't care about science. You know, I believe what I believe and I believe it's true. I mean, religion, for example, is largely based on faith. Uh, and you say, well, where's the evidence? The evidence doesn't count. I have faith. Why should I need evidence? <laughs> 
So, I mean, that's a driving force as well, because, in fact, faith exists within science sometimes, too. Ah, yeah. <laughs> the theoretical particle is <laughs> useful sometimes. Well, 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 what do you mean, the particle? The boson? Well, can, can, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, my, my rudimentary understanding is... Mine probably is the, uh, the, there's dark matter and there, there's Maybe. when <laughs> uh, and we could, how how can we measure it? There, there, there's no ways of measuring it or gravitation. But, oh, I, I'm not I'm, I'm not up on this. I'm just I, I'm aware that sometimes uh, as a a way to get to the next level of understanding. Scientists use a proxy idea, and that proxy idea gets filled. Like so, ether, the notion of ether, might be considered a proxy for the scientific world to get to a better understanding, because that then disappears. And oh well, oxygen. The you know, we we and these proxy ideas are hypotheses, convenient hypotheses. So it's not even not necessarily bad to to throw out an idea that that's as long as it's open to criticism, as long as you know the scientific method and scrutiny is again the example that you gave of a scientist killing not an isolated example, actually. Mm. There are quite a number. So just coming back to that point that I made about scientists being human beings and academics in general subject to enormous pressures. Actually, they have this dual pressure on them. They have to conform enough to be able to make a living and have look after their families, etc. But at the same time, to pursue their interests, to pursue scientific endeavour, they have to Look, be, be a little bit subversive and be resilient to the fact that if they're subversive and they, they come up with something that's game changing, like Einstein saying Newton's wrong, <laughs> you know, a world of ridicule for a period of time will be heaped upon them publicly. Well, it was, wasn't it? And, and for a postal, no, uh, <laughs> patent clerk. Patent clerk, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but that yes. was what I was saying earlier on about, you know, that that's. As a psychologist, that you actually have to look not just at the facts and the evidence, you have to look at the context, and part of that context is the human context. Well, absolutely. I mean, I was talking to uh, Alex uh, a short while back about because I studied for a while at the Science Studies Unit here in Edinburgh. Do you know it? Yeah. Oh, right. Science That's Studies so Unit. Sociology and Philosophy of Science. Oh, okay. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's all about how scientific ideas are informed by, you know, the personalities, the thinking, the ideologies of the individuals. It is social imagery. There you go. Not at all, not at all. Oh, well. I didn't know how long it was going to be thank, tonight. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for being rude. I hope well, it was... I hope the train is on time. Yeah. <laughs> Safe home. Uh, and do, much, take, take some food home uh, if, if there's anything that you like the look of. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Um, so I, I, I think that's got you know taking me through. I, you know, there's it's such a rich area. There's uh, I was thinking about bringing my. There's a wonderful book called The Garrison and Morton, and it. It was a, a, a pre-digital uh, attempt to bring a bibliography of scientific discovery together, and it's a gorgeous book. It's just listing the order of papers in fields, but it's helped me go, all oh, right, so this understanding triggered this work, and this work then triggered this work, and uh, it, it, I, I hope I've... I've prompted at least an interesting conversation and I would really invite you to help me see my myopias. What have I left out? 
what <laughs> what what have, you know what have I misapprehended? What what would be a good exercise for me to do as a thinker? And that's that's what's drawn me to be interested in the philosophy of science. I always remember what they said is that answers are not important, it's the questions that are important. <laughs> Don't give me a tree, give me a forest. <laughs> 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 yeah, this is a good, this one. Uh, okay, well, thank you. Right. Did, did that hold together for anybody? Yeah, really interesting. <laughs> I, I would actually offer the observation. It didn't have much to do with the philosophy of science, but there we can get back to that. <laughs> well, how, I, I liked what you said. How, how can we separate one subject from another? George Elder Davies writes about the democratic well, we in the past, yeah. and how all subject matters converge in philosophy. You know, it's, and, and it's you know that was the the pedagogical tradition of the Scottish universities pre anglicisation Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a kind of a, a phrase, isn't there, in, in Scottish thinking? A man of hearts, and that's what George Davies uses. In uh, his, his books, I I I all for interdisciplinarity and making porous the the, the bounds between subject disciplines. And I would argue definitely arts. If you do the sciences, do the arts. Well, read that if book that I, I gave you by by Terry Lovell because it kind of links you know, philosophy of science and aesthetics and breaking thinking about the arts. It's really, really interesting. It's hard work. Oh, it... and if you don't mind a bit of hard work, there is one book that I would recommend called Girdle Escher Back. Oh, yes. The Golden Grade. And that's pretty hard going. It's got some, it's got some tough maths in there that beyond my grade, I have to say. <laughs> but reading the, the interlinkages between the the Eternal Golden Braid, yes. Douglas Hofstadter, and yeah. uh -huh. the Seed. Related this, to the woman on uh, YouTube. I'm Sabine, not sure. Sabine Hofstadter, she's a scientist. Oh. Yeah. Maybe. Well, he, he, he discusses things like uh, tangled hierarchy or the strange loop. Yeah. So if we look at the. Escher painting, a uh, drawing, engraving <laughs> of the waterfall yeah. always going up and always going down. As I think his work is really helpful for how we're negotiating paradox or apparent paradox. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, but, but, but I read that you. as a work of philosophy, actually. Uh. So, and so I, I totally get what you're saying about the not always being clear distinctions, even between sociology. I mean, I'm, I, I studied politics. I'm not a scientist. It's just politics. I'm just well read. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that shows. <laughs> and, and I work in science now, actually, um, but as a manager. So the academics, they, they, they look to me. Um, but I just think that we make a, an error actually when we sub specialise too much. And you know, politics taught me about game theory, and game theory taught me through maths and maths and to girdle. And <laughs> so, so they, they are all interconnected, and we we, we sub specialise too much in our peril. Well, 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 you see, as a psychologist, I would say, of course they're interconnected because it's well, a common element, us. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. But also, um, it, 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 in the past, I mean, science was not separated as a different kind of area. It was natural philosophy, and it was to do with the philosophy of the world. Oh, and Aristotle. Sorry? Look at Aristotle. Bugger with the bottle. Pardon? It was a bugger with the bottle. Aristotle, a bugger with the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's yeah. all philosophy and science, yeah, and maths, and all. When you talk about the origin of the word science, I mean, it goes back to the word skill, I know. Yeah. Oh, and that's, that's, that's what it's all about at the end of the day, do I know? <laughs> mm, 
I mean, trying to you, you saw me trying to get back to what what what's what's in these words that I'm using. What what is knowledge? Uh, well, coming to know. I'm coming to know this, and what do I have to do to in that process of coming to know? That speaks to me of scientific method and the 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 tools we use to come to know something. Uh, are you know involved in apprehension and error checking, and I I just feel it's it, one of the joyous things in all of our lives. Think about uh, by the way, Ed, please. I'm just now waffling, but please, <laughs> if you we all have been only um, well, I I've got a, 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 a friend as a political scientist who was saying right. Everything's political, Alex. Everything's political. And I, I've had to work out how do I respond to that. So I'm thinking about a subject field as a sui generis, a cause of itself. A language, a set of language used to describe things. So Brian was like always returning to this point. It's all political. So I I came to this response eventually. I said, okay, so if everything's political, right, can you describe only using the lexicon of politics, the biology of a cell, or the physics of an imploding star? Well, I would argue if you do, you're going to run up to very fundamental constraints because astrophysics and biology are lexicons specifically designed when we're looking at these phenomena in, and these aspects of phenomena. So I would argue that as we move, we should be able to move subject discipline and we should learn many languages and be able to move between them and see how they interrelate because one subject, a chemist will be able to reveal an aspect that a biologist hasn't thought about and working together. Thank you. Yeah, Cheers. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take, take any food that you'd like, please. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> At the end of the day, they're all united by one thing, which are all actions and consequences. Whether you're looking at politics, whether you're looking at astrophysics, whether you're looking at psychology, yeah, it's all about actions and consequences. It, well, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very deep. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's true, though, and um, one one of the things that always surprises me, though, is that you know, I, so I, I I'm, I'm director for the Cancer Research Institute here in Edinburgh, and in Glasgow, in fact, so the Cancer Research Fund. So right. I sit at the back of the class right. while people are doing lectures for postdocs on cell biology. Genetics, Fantastic. and then I go across the road to the School of Inflammation, and I sit at the back of their classes. <laughs> so, but, Can I ask, yeah, but, but my professors, they they subspecialize, and as I've been, I've only been in my current post for six months, but as I go around and I meet all of them, and they're telling me about you know um, cell signaling and all of these things that are, are specific to cancer, and, and then I'll be asking, well, okay. What about inflammation? Is there a precursor? And what about this? And what about that? Mm. <laughs> and, <laughs> so and and I guess that's... Do they want so? Yes, they do. The, yeah. and, and sometimes they decide that they need to tweak things, tweak their projects slightly, oh, and right. work with the School of Information, or work with the School of Computer Science. So, yes. you know, because I've spotted things that they haven't, and I'm not a scientist, but I... But I've got a free range brain and, <laughs> and I'm very autodidactic and, and I'll join I'll make linkages that they don't see because they are absolute experts in their subspecialist field. <laughs> and it, it just doesn't occur to them that that inflammatory precursor phase of the illness is relevant. And actually, why should we wait? Why don't we do some joint work with the school of inflammation? So we I'm rambling, but the point that I'm trying to Ooh. make is that. Um, we, we become too um, in, in our own little frame and, and it, it blinds us, it, 
blinkers as to Well, the danger is that sometimes knowledge creates blinkers. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, well, it's incredible. Some of yeah. the smartest mm. people that I've ever known are, I mean, we're all blinkers, but, but they are also blinkered in their own way. And I, I, I feel very humble when I'm, I'm scared sometimes. So, what about this? What about that? Because <laughs> I'm not a scientist. <laughs> well, you have to look back a very long time before it was possible for one person to know everything there was to know. <laughs> the encyclopedias. Yeah. I mean, that's the danger that, as you say, any specialization can create blinkers, it creates echo chambers. And, you know, we talk about that quite a lot these days with things like the social media, etc. You know, people get blinkered by the social media group they belong to in the well, echo chamber. Just, happens in science too. Yeah, let's well, give you an example. My, my, uh, Paramore. Uh, she's, unlike me, a real uh, student of film. And her specialism is the transition from sound, from silent to sound film. That's what she's doing. She wow. Yeah. Um, and so she's having to kind of bone up on loads of science yeah. about all the kind of technology that was kind of created to make sound film possible. I mean, one, one amazing scientist that I've worked with is interested in evolutionary biology and says to me, I've got a great new idea, Denise. Um, it's all about the evolution of altruism, the genetic level. And of course, we're only altruistic because our genes think that it's a great selfish strategy. So, <laughs> you know, so, so then I, I'm interested. But then I had to say, well, hang on a minute. If that's the case, then what about these different things around game theory? Actually, the selfish pursuit of self-interest churns out very strange results. And actually, perhaps that um, emotion, emotion is part of the program. It's an override in our program to counteract funny results that we get when we pursue rational self-interest. And this guy is one of the smartest guys that I've ever known. He's focusing just on the genetic because that's his interest. And I'm like, well, what about emotion? We scientists don't delve into that nonsense. But <laughs> still, it's part of the program. Emotions evolved too, therefore they must have a purpose. Well, it's all down to dopamine. Possibly, <laughs> <laughs> possibly. Robert Sapolsky writes very interestingly on this, uh, in both in his book uh, uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Stomach Ulcers and in his book Behave. And of course, it, it's... Why don't they? Uh, well, Maybe I can learn something. <laughs> it, uh, it, it looks at the, the, the sociological environment as a, an important aspect of the habitat. So as social creatures, uh, we encounter stress and trauma. But when we're, we've got people support network, that biochemical change in our physiology, you know, the glucocorticoids, the adrenals are all you know, ripping our, our, our bodies. But for some reason, when we're in a support network, we mitigate those stresses and traumas. And that, that's, that's in, important to understand in, in an increasingly isolated world. How, uh, how are we seeing rises in certain illnesses in the people rise who are loneliness, which is being talked about mm. quite extensively these days in psychology? So it well, became particularly prominent during the pandemic. Of course, sure, yes, I was going to raise that. Yeah. Mm. Well, with pack animals, fundamentally, mm. we've evolved as pack <laughs> animals. So absolutely, that, that isolation and also the role of technology in further isolating us in, in a paradoxical well, way. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, in a curious way, because I see this with my own kids, you know, they're on their phones, on their iPads all the time, but they don't see anybody. We don't actually socialise that much. Ooh. Ooh. So it's a real loss to society. Children don't go out in, as teenagers and 
get into the drunken spirit that we all did. Absolutely, that's awesome. I'm saying we're going to end up like the Japanese, where there's a whole generation of Japanese young men who never go out. Mm-hmm. Just sit in the room all the time. It's, it's become diagnosable in Japan. Mm-hmm. And it's a major problem. It's also causing a population problem because they're not procreating mm-hmm. either. Yeah. So there are if you say you're true in China as well. Well, China's a bit different. Uh, China's got a more political context because, of course, you had the Cultural Revolution there, and then you had the restriction on childbearing in China, where families were only supposed to have one child, and then eventually well, that's realized... the case, is it? No, it's not the oh, case now. Oh, it's changed. It's changed. Yeah. And in fact, they're actually looking at encouraging people to have more children in China. Oh, wow. Vegetarian for a fresh beer. All right, well, Mrs. Minnis. Mrs. Minnis. Yep, yeah. well, thank you. Okay. Yeah, they've changed, they've changed it, the thing in, in China that uh, you can now have more. Well, actually, it was never completely uh, the case anyway, because it was the case that if you lived in a rural environment, you could have more children because you actually needed more children to run the farm and to do the farm work, etc. But if you were a sort of higher order and living in cities and things, it was a strict one child per family uh, order. But they've changed that now because, in fact, Chinese population has fallen for the first time ever. Mm-hmm. Well, at least the first time recorded ever. <laughs> but, uh, and they're, they're concerned about it and they're looking actually at what they need to do about that because they're worried that they've got a rapidly aging population and nobody to look after them. Well, it's the same true here, of course. Well, well, it's, it's even true. worse if you've only had one child per family, mm-hmm. because uh, you know if something happens to that child, gone. You know, there's nobody looking after the the elderly group. I mean, here because families. Well, talking very averagely, but the average family had two point something children. You know, so if one child died off, there was still somebody there who might be looking after the older people. But in China, that's now a major problem because of the one-child policy. That there's nobody to look after a lot of the elderly population at all. Isn't that interesting? I, and I think just going back to the the, the title of this session, to how how we all think we know. <laughs> I think that's a lovely example. You know, we we both sat there and thought, no, absolutely, it's still in place in China, although no, it's not. So. I'm reading a book at the moment it's called Animal Societies um, about the evolution of um, social behaviour in animals. And Ooh. one of the chapters in there was uh, all about actually that there is strong mathematical evidence about single in- if, if we have societies where individuals make decisions, the, the end result is far worse. And that is why we have things like people sitting on a jury because there's an optimal number of all the biases, all the decisions that people make in a heartbeat based on what they think they know for sure. China has a one baby policy, for example, um, that you have 12 people together and usually all of that is even down to mathematical. Well, sometimes it's just all of unintended consequences. You don't actually realise what the consequence of your action is going to be. But there was a thing we used to do in psychology, which was um, we used to get people to imagine a situation where they were landing on the moon to go to a space station on the moon, but their spacecraft crashed before it actually arrived at the destination on the moon. And they had a number of artifacts that they could rescue from the craft. <laughs> and, and what they're, was going to happen to, like... to get to the space station? <laughs> And people would choose different things depending on what their view was. And you could actually analyze it because there were probabilities attached to this in terms of how survivable these choices were likely to be. And what you showed was that if people actually did it as a group, they actually as a group made more survivable choices than the individuals did because they actually swapped information and they came to better conclusions about which artifacts they should actually take in order to stand a genuine chance of surviving. There's an interesting movie called Moon, by David Bowie's son, interestingly. And it's this guy on the moon who's just like, hello, (coughs) like 
manning this space station. And it turns out that he could have been replaced, but he's replaced by a clone of himself. <laughs> so it's just like he's just, you know, an artificial being, and he's just replaced by another artificial being. Devastating. I'm moving on to the machines now. <laughs> 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 yes. That could be another another session in its own right. Mm. Artificial intelligence. Well, it's mm. a good good film. The cre the creator just out. Mm. It's fantastic. Creator. Yeah. Well you get into all kinds of interesting questions there, which is not really where it's tonight's question, but if you create a clone that is an absolute clone, which one's the real one? <laughs> uh, it's like you would know more about this than I do. The Turing test. You know, how do you? No, I mean Turing you know, test. You put work someone in a room and you ask them questions. Yeah, but Turing tests don't work even now. I mean, a lot of artificial intelligence can pass the Turing test, no problem at all. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you work at academia. I mean, they're writing essays and things, and academics are now using whatever that AI program is to detect whether they're. The essays written by. Yes, because our children going to universities are just using yeah. the programs. Turn well, well, the, 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 now we need counter AI to identify. Disaster, disaster <laughs> things. I used to make quite a lot of money out of writing essays for students. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So, but the interesting thing is, when we talk about the Turing test, which was 1940s, yeah. and uh, you know, there was a legitimate thing that you, know, you could actually use the Turing test quite meaningfully to detect things that were artificial. But you, know, you look at where we've come in that relatively short time in terms of being able to produce machines that now take the Turing test for granted. When people are talking about artificial <laughs> intelligence and saying, oh, it will never be quite the same as humans. But you know, look at how far we've come in a short time. Who knows how much further we're going to go in another 10 years, 20 years, 50 well, years. Yeah. Well, the, the terror prospect, of course, is the AI becomes so smart, it doesn't need us anymore. There's one of my favourite stories from science fiction, which is about uh, how we invent this absolutely super artificial intelligence, which is capable of controlling absolutely everything. And we say, what's really important is that your main task is to make sure that human beings are safe and happy. <laughs> so the artificial intelligence injects us all with a, a drug and wraps us in cotton wool. <laughs> um, that sounds like that's, brave, brave New World, essentially. That, that, that's not quite what we meant. <laughs> <laughs> but the artificial intelligence say, well, that's what you asked for. <laughs> you're safe, you're happy. So it's interesting, though, because in, in healthcare, so I, I, I actually spent 20 years as an NHS manager. I only recently moved into academia. So stupid NHS managers, of course. Um, <laughs> have, the NHS, they have, look after me so well, wonderfully. But, well, the whole so. time that I was in the NHS, um, we have been planning, trying to address workforce crises, and one of the ways that we've all been trying to plan for the dearth of radiologists is, we've said, right, okay, well, they can be, they can be replaced. The, the AI, we, you know, <laughs> we develop the AI, at some point the AI is coming for, for imaging, they will be replaced, and so therefore there's been a, a planning light for the wholesale um, training. It takes eight years or so to train the radiologist. So there's been a there's been a blight on that because we've expected the the yeah, AI to catch up. Become a surgeon and they start in that can't you? <laughs> well absolutely. But it was only about six months ago when I started in academia and I was learning more about artificial intelligence and the top experts here in Edinburgh, with Edinburgh the global leader in AI, actually, they said, you know, to, to replace a radiologist, a radiologist actually has about 200,000 algorithms in their brains to enable them to do what they do. And for every algorithm, there's a, an investment required for about 100,000 pounds. <laughs> so even just to replace one member of very crucial member of the workforce, what sort of investment would be required to be able to replace them? But so the other interesting it, it, thing... I, it's, I don't think there will ever be a replacement of the humans. Well, there may be. I mean, we, we don't know. But I mean, one of the interesting things is if you look at AI, and I was looking at AI particularly in relation to surgery at one point, 
And what's interesting is that if you give the AI all the information, it will often come to a more correct conclusion about what needs to be done than the surgeon would. Uh, and in fact, that actually happens now. I mean, surgeons are increasingly using AI in order to detect what and it is they actually need to do. Like that, yes. But the other side of the coin, interestingly, was that if there was an ambiguous situation where the information alone was not enough to make the decision, the surgeon generally made the better decision because they were going on things like experience or instinct, which in an ambiguous situation turned out to be better than the AI could do because the AI could only work on the basis of the facts. Well, that's a lovely example of what I was saying earlier on when I had to have a word with my esteemed colleague and say emotions have evolved <laughs> and an override to the funny results churned out by rational pursuit of self-interest. We can't be reasoning and, and mulling over all these different that's a strange metaphor. <laughs> yeah. But you know, fight or flight is instinctive. It happens within a split second, the decision making process. So I, I, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that for us to be replaced by robots that can be better than us, it wouldn't have to be just the, the rational programs that would have to be replicated in machines, it would also have to be emotional. Well, that's what I think we're trying to do, though, because, again, in, in psychology, one of the interesting things has been, can you replace a psychological therapist with an AI therapist? Uh, and, really? Wow. Well, so actually, in psychology as well. There's quite a lot of, of uh, work being done on this, and up to a certain point, Yes, you can, because, I mean, some psychological therapies work on a relatively systematic basis, and you can teach the AI the system, and it will go through things like cognitive behavior therapy is a relatively systemized therapy, and you, know, you can teach an AI how you go through the steps for that. But the big difference is that empathic engagement, that, you know, can the AI actually recognize how the other person might be feeling, can we actually interpret some of the signals as emotions? Uh, and at the moment, we can't, but they're working on that. They're Emotional working on how you actually well, get AI it, should, to express and appreciate emotions. Sure, the thing is this, that one of the fears, if you like, about AI is not so much that we will kind of succumb to it, but it will take over from us. Mm. That it will become much, much smarter than we are. And that's, it has no further need of us. It's a great film called Ex Machina. Ex Machina. Oh, that's a wonderful film. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's about a Turing test of an AI. Yeah. Well, that, that, I mean, that's one of the things that a number of people who are working in AI are talking about as a genuine danger, that you know, if yes. AI becomes sufficiently intelligent, maybe it will decide it doesn't need human beings at all. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> but it would have to become emotionally intelligent and not necessarily. As, far as, as far as we know, but to be able to counteract the bad results that tend to come out of overt rationality, um, it would need to have some level of emotional intelligence. And the scientists say well, that's that very... that, come, that tends to come from social interaction. So well, that's a very human response, isn't it? And that's actually putting human sensibility above that of the emotionally non-existent, but you know, well, even rational. Honey, even the honeybees. You see, it's missing. They, they, they have social hierarchy because yeah, it's missing the key point, though, which I mean, people tend to gloss over. You say it's a very human perspective, and that's absolutely true because human beings, at the end of the day, are artificial intelligences. <laughs> we, we are Speak simply, for yourself. <laughs> we, no, we I'm going to want. I'm going to see you again. Uh, see you again. Uh, we are simply biological chunks who have developed through our <laughs> processing and our evolution the ability to experience emotions. But if you were to say, how does that happen? We don't know. I mean, we're talking earlier about consciousness. We've no idea. How consciousness actually develops and things like emotions are part of consciousness but at the end of the day it has to be down to biology because that all, that's all there is 
So if it's just down to biology, why couldn't the AI reproduce that in some different form? Yeah, if it is mechanistic at the end of the day, whether you're talking about biological mechanistic, electronic mechanistic, mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, sure. if it's produced by the mechanistic process, why wouldn't an AI be able to develop it? Mm -hmm. No, I hadn't thought about it that way. You're absolutely right. If it's been built into the program, however it's been built in, if it's been built in through generations of social interaction or whatever, it's still mm -hmm. become part of the program and has been developed. So, yeah. Like when a, a critical mass of information is yes. brought together, it does do properties emerge. So, yes. uh, I, 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 I find this this whole area fascinating, but uh, of course, uh, I've not read a heck of a lot of the real science behind it. But I pick up on the, the there's lots of media representations of AI. And uh, I, I quite like, uh, is it Jarad Lani, the one of the progenitors of virtual reality, old hack, Silicon Valley. And some of his commentaries on technology are pretty good because they're grounded. And he seems a very now, now guy. But uh, yeah, he, he, he goes, well, you know, it's a mashup of all the information put in. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things was just recently that I was reading a comment by Elon Musk, of all people, uh, and he was being challenged about the, the future of uh, technology and artificial intelligence. And he was saying, you know, you only have to look back 30 or 40 years and uh, a video game was two bats pushing a ball from yes, one side to the other. Yes, yes. Says now, if you have a video game, the characters have personalities, the characters display emotions yes. within your video game. He says, that's happened within 40 years. <laughs> and you're telling me it can't develop further. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's amazing, isn't it? I remember computer games when I was a child, they were just as used described. <laughs> <laughs> When yeah. I was a child, we didn't have computers. <laughs> uh, and, and now my own children are at school, and in fact, uh, linguistics, they're both being taught coding mm -hmm. in primary school. And really? Language. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Scot I... Scottish state schools are now teaching Python and coding this, this on the curriculum. What, what, what was fascinating to me uh, was finding out that Pythagoras jealously guarded it's mathematics and said, oh, no, no, it's only for a leap mind, a leap brains. And what's nice is we're seeing children being taught Pythagorean theorem. Uh, now you say that, those those prejudices are still in place, though, I think. Oh, yes. And, and yes Winston Churchill brought in the policy of separating the social beach from the chat by only the public schools would teach classics. And that, did, interesting and that is still in place even to this day. I've had to teach myself Latin. And classics more generally, because that, apart from being a geek, I'm a terrible also. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but most people from my class don't ever have any exposure to, to that. Which, so, so they are being taught the useful things <laughs> in this era of coding, but they're not being taught how to understand their past and their heritage and science in a deeper way. And I've only that because I, I my well, they say that the important thing about education is not teaching facts, but teaching people how to think and find out. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Has to think critically. But Pythagoras, I was going to say, is that they've just discovered that actually his theorem was invented several hundred years before him because they've discovered a clay tablet with Pythagoras' theorem basically on it. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. I, I, Beautiful human foible story. Uh, thank you both for your conversation and company. You too, it's uh, great. It really and um, I've got a new book that I need to go and buy now. Uh, and if, a if, languages book. I've already put it in my wish list in Amazon. <laughs> it's a real, real pleasure of a book. It's, uh, it's one of these unusual uh, authors who can take a very complex thing 
uh, and draw you through it, and it, that you don't feel like you've been dragged through a hedge backwards. Yeah. You know, some some texts you're like, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I've got through verse chapter. I'm going to take time to recover. But the, it's just a love. It's a great, a great writer. Please do put my name on any uh, public events. Then I, I love the fact you're sitting in and listening. <laughs> the, uh, it, it's I've stolen my education. <laughs> foraging. There's well, yes. loads of foraging to be done, and Ed, you know Edinburgh you know, the universities. Of all, I used to sneak into the, the, the lots of lectures there, and and my experience of lectures is like. You know, when when discovered, it's like, oh well, I'm glad you're interested. There's lots of dicta for your students who've come in and dicta for them. But they're not just sat in the back and yeah, tell me about the origin of Arabic. Great, you know, or yeah. or whatever. And uh, yeah. So yeah. so yeah, I will do. I mean, it's interesting though. I I know for sure that. I would never have made the entrance criteria to go and study at the University of Edinburgh or have had the funds, having come from England, I would have had to pay to, <laughs> to actually get in, you know? So, and, and it, it's kind of strange now, in a way, that I'm one of their, uh, I'm one of the, the leadership, I'm one of the leadership team, but I wouldn't have made it onto their course. Universities have gone downhill, I have to say. But they're not the education institutions they once were. They're factories turning out students, mm -hmm. and students are customers. Mm -hmm. But the class um, prejudices and divides that stop people from my sort of background getting in, and you know, they're, they're still in place, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So my challenge now is to try and change some things. <laughs> Anything I can do to support your work. Thank you. At your Thank service. You. Thank <laughs> you so much. Anyway, lovely to meet you both. Lovely and, to meet you. Um, yeah, I look forward to the next session. Sorry I was late. No, no, no. Think I was driving back from more. Glasgow and I messaged you to say, please can I still come? Because I've been looking forward to it. Think of this more like a rolling house party. You can come and go and it's just chill. Are we doing like people from Glasgow? <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually live just down the road in Cannon Mills, All right. but um, the Cancer Research Fund and, at the University of Edinburgh mm -hmm. in Glasgow fairly recently merged, and they only created my role in April, so now I spend half the week working in Glasgow and at the Peterson Institute and half the week. Now, I'm interested in the background because I worked for the health service for 35 years. Oh, really? And when I retired, I was the professional advisor for psychology for NHS Lillian. Okay. Um, so I mean, the health service is in my blood. Yeah, well, I'll be <laughs> Even now, after I've been retired for a few years. Yeah. I'm sure you're in it, blood too. <laughs> yeah, gosh, well, you, you too. And um, I was the general manager of Edinburgh Cancer Centre, and so running cancer services for South East Scotland until April. So well, my wife's an NHS Logan, we could join counselling. <laughs> my wife's an advanced nurse practitioner in medicine of the elderly. Okay. At the Western? At the Royal Infirmary. At the Royal Infirmary. And uh, so I still have all that interest in, in the health service through her as well. Yeah, so. 35 years, though. Did they give you a medal when you retired, having done 35? I think they'd like to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> Ask too many awkward questions. No, me too, me too, I'm sure. Um, but, but now I get to just focus on the game-changing stuff in, in academia and research. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. So, so yeah, that's why I was late this evening, coming back from Glasgow. So apologies. I'll try and be on time. Never need to <laughs> apologise. You know, everybody's always welcome, and I hope that it's just known as a warm, enjoyable space because I I enjoy it. I, I mean, it's just become a part of life that I really look forward to. Yeah, no, it's great. It for fifteen years. Fifteen years, I know. Fifteen years, you've been doing this, really. I think wow. I've never given you loving talks to the group. I, know. I thought it was ten when I was up. Doing my last talk, but I checked back and I've actually done eleven. Talk, talks for the group. Yes. Really? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, I just, you know, very effectively draw me into well, you know, psychology is a, a, a fascinating subject to me now because it, it, you know, looking from the outside into the subject, you don't know any of the detail, and now it's. 
actually this, that's where I've referred to it. Yeah. So this is an atom. This is yeah. the inside of an atom that used to be a unitary fundamental particle as, as we understood it. And it shows further out that you know we advance in our knowledge and, and started to understand quarks. And one second, I will show you. Here are the three quarks and every atom interacting. And we, then we thought we've cracked it and we really understood the atom. So that's what it's showing, the quarks interacting with each other. And no, now we've got to this. Fantastic. Amazing. That blew me away when I saw that. Because if you actually look, if you, if you scale up and you look at images of the universe, the, the known universe as we can see it, it looks a lot like that. Of course, that's one of the things science fiction writers have been writing about for a long time. Isn't Are that you actually simply an atom in a bigger universe? Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, Paul Dear was writing, you know, very similarly, like just. Uh, but that blew me away. Honestly. It's it's such a beautiful thing. <laughs> it just it's lovely. And underlies the point that you are making. How do we ever know what we think we know? Well. We carry on. We carry on asking questions. Carry on asking. Well, that's why we're saying. At the end of the day, science is not the answer. It's a methodology that enables us to achieve the best answers we can given the circumstances as they exist. Have you have you ever come across the, the series in our time, Melvin well, Brown? What what a fantastic contribution to the world he's done in that series. Didn't see the series. Really? Yeah. Oh, you, you, so. This is, this is part of the reason that I, I'm, I'm so autodidactic because I've, I've, over the last 20 years or so I've been listening to In Our Time <laughs> and there's always a reading list at the end of every subject. He gets top academic professionals to come in and give an overview of their subject like the atom, the electron and then <laughs> there's a whole reading list to go with it at the end. And so no, if you're a geek like me you then go off and you read about it and then the next week it will be um, the Achaemenids in the Persian Empire, and you do the same thing. <laughs> the thing I always like is the TED Talks. The, the, another great contribution to the world. Yeah. Because it's all sort of an idea encapsulated in a sort of 15, 20 minute presentation mm -hmm. by somebody who knows what they're talking about. And it's quite often quite fascinating because it's, it's aimed as a non technical audience yeah. because of, of the way they're actually doing it. So the explanations are. Almost understandable at times. Well, Melvin Bragg does this. It's, it's almost yeah, it's like okay. a few, few he, he does a great job of uh, uh, choreographing the, mm -hmm. the, the, the academics so that the, the, the listener is given a, a really person. good, yeah. Yeah, the lay person given that introduction. And Ted, Ted talks in, yeah, fantastic. Uh, yeah, digestible in a nutshell, but you know. That the, the Melbourne Brack was in our time. They they're about an hour long or so, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And yeah, just every, every week it's something random like Shakespeare. Or <laughs> um, but even so, it's it's very digestible. But if, if you have quite an eclectic interest and love to learn, and, and, you know, natural curiosity, it's they're all it's YouTube very now as well. And BBC right. Sounds as well. Oh, Spotify, well, Spotify has them. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so yes, Melbourne Brag has a lot to answer for. <laughs> I love the cookery, but anyway, lovely to meet you. And I'll see you next time. Thank if you very much. If there's any of this food that you like, strawberry. Oh, do you like chocolate? Just chocolate. Yeah. Those, I, I argue, are some of the finest chocolate biscuits anybody oh, yes. can buy. Oh, yeah, yeah there's some chocolate that would buy. And I'm going as well, so I shall see you. A pleasure as ever, Ray. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.